so <clears throat> the Taimian project, um, we'll talk about epistemology, ontology, hermeneutics, and answering some of the concept, uh, uh, some of the concerns of uh, speculative theology. Yeah. We'll also talk about some of the eccentricities um, uh, where he upheld uh, minority positions uh, and some of the accusations. Right. Um, so choosing a methodology of engagement is the first thing. Uh, why did I talk about the turning of the tide and all of the discussions uh, between rational theologians and speculative theologians? Uh, because he came at a time where the uh, rational theologians continued to condemn the literalism of Atheris and, and Anhanabadis, uh, and some would call them, you know, Hashwaya or Hashawaya. Hashwaya means that they report things without comprehension, and Hashawaya would mean that they are marginal and eccentric. Um, and no one escaped from this, even the greatest of sort of uh, imams in the, in, in the traditional sense. So someone like an Imam al-Khuzayma, for instance, he's, he used to be called Imam al aimma the Imam of Imams, uh, because, uh, you know, he was, uh, of his, you know, in terms of people in his time, um, he had the greatest knowledge of the Quran and the Sunnah and the reports from uh, the predecessors and all, all of that stuff. Uh, but he was called by some of the uh, rational theologians, uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, unstable, <laughs> you know, and uh, defective mentally and things of that nature. And he was, was called Hashwi, uh, that he reports things without comprehension. So unless you are you have mastery of the rational sciences, which basically was Aristotelian logic and, you know, philosophy and so on. Uh, unless you have mastery of the rational sciences, um, you were basically considered not fit to talk about these issues. And these are issues of creed. So they apparently are relevant uh, to those Muslim scholars and they will talk about them. And they did not think that we need to be uh, basically masterful in, uh, in Greek logic to talk about uh, the creed, Islamic creed. So there were three ways to address this problem. Uh, they were not talking the same language. Uh, the, the rational theologians felt that they have every reason to reinterpret the scriptures because the, whenever the scriptures came into conflict with reason, then we either accept the scripture, and in this case would be, we would be impugning the foundation uh, upon which the scriptures were accepted in the first place, which is reason, uh, or accept reason, uh, or accept both, but they are in conflict, so we cannot accept both. So the rational theologians were uh, reinterpreting, uh, this is what they have decided um, to reinterpret everything that was in conflict with uh, reason. Uh, so there were three ways to, to go about this uh, for a, from the perspective of a Hanbali growing up in, the, in these uh, sort of times. Uh, he would either continue to cite the scriptures and statements of the predecessors uh, or mount a counter argument that's purely rational or put together a systematic discourse that harmonizes the scriptural and rational proofs. The third is what Ibn Taymiyyah chose. And he makes it clear that uh, had we not, had they not talked about God in these terms, we would have not needed to talk about him in these terms. Uh, had they not uh, basically started this discussion um, we would have not needed to uh, be involved in it. So he says we did not need in our belief in Allah and his messenger such methods. Rather, we mentioned them because those who followed them used to contradict the words of Allah and his messenger by means of these methods, claiming that they had rational evidence that contradicted what the messengers brought. We revealed the truths of these methods. 
that they are presented to demonstrate that to, uh, that they presented to demonstrate that what contradicts the texts is false, and what does not contradict the texts may be true or false, and what is true and does not contradict the texts may not be needed. Rather, the rational methods that the texts uh, indicate and lead to are more powerful, easier to grasp, and more beneficial for this Quran guides to that which is most upright. So he's saying, I will um, basically be involved in rational uh, theology, uh, but this is not because it is, uh, it, it, it is my sort of desire or interest. It is basically uh, poking holes into the rational arguments so that we can go back and accept the scriptural uh, purports or imports or conclusions. And, and, and certainly, you know, someone like Kant, for instance, the, the whole idea of metaphysics and the utility of metaphysics in uh, describing the unseen uh, or speculating about the unseen, um, I think it is quite rational uh, to think that, you know, the metaphysics is not capable of uh, describing the unseen. Uh, so his, his epistemology is based on this verse, and he quotes this verse multiple times, uh, in which Allah SWT says, وَلِلَّهِ غَيْبُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْعَرْضُ وَمَعْمُرُ السَّاعِ إِلَّا كَرَمْحِ الْبَصْرَ وَهُوَ أَقْرَبْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ وَاللَّهُ أَخْرَجَكُمْ مِنْ بُطُونِ يَوْمَاتِكُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ شَيْءٍ وَجَعَلَ لَكُمْ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَبْسَارُ وَالْأَفِيدَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ So, and to Allah belongs the unseen aspects of the heavens and the earth. So, the knowledge of the unseen belongs to Allah. And then Allah tells us about, uh, you know, the, the faculties that he gave us to uh, have knowledge. And uh, he says, uh, indeed, Allah is over all things competent. And Allah has extracted you from the wombs of your mothers, not knowing a thing. And he made for you hearing and vision and intellect. Uh, Afida is more comprehensive than intellect, but that's the best word to translate it. That perhaps you would be grateful. That perhaps you would be grateful. So in this verse, there are three different, basically, uh, sources of knowledge. You have the hearing, which points to truthful reports. And truthful reports, according to Imam Taymiyyah, you know, you could basically prove their truthfulness by either miracles of the prophets or concurrence of human beings, uh, such as the existence of China in their times, despite the fact that no one has seen China, or that's concurrence. And the, you know, uh, the, the, the miracles of the prophets uh, to prove the truthfulness of what they have conveyed from God. And then you have empirical findings, that's vision, that's sight. And he calls this most certain because al khabar kal muayana. So to hear is not like to see. So he calls, you know, empirical senses the most certain, but he calls the hearing most resourceful or most beneficial for man because most of what man knows comes through reports. Uh, most of what we know about physics, we, 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 we didn't, you know, uh, have this knowledge through our own experience uh, or biology or this or that, or everything. These are things that we are being told. Uh, and then he, he points out reason as, uh, uh, or, or the intellect. He, he calls it an instinct and he calls it a potency. So, it is a potency. It is not simply a blank slate, but it is also not uh, what the innatists would do, would say about it. It's somewhere between the empiricists and the innatists. Uh, it, it is a potency. It does have certain daruri knowledge uh, basically embedded into it. Certain daruri means necessary knowledge. Uh, but but necessary here is not necessarily uh, the necessary truth versus the contingent truth uh, in the Western tradition. Uh, 
So he, he, he says that there are, he wants to say that there are multiple sources of knowledge that corroborate each other. And according to Karl Sharif Tubgi, uh, Dr. Karl Sharif Tubgi, mm. uh, who was on your program before. Oh, yes. Um, book and, uh, uh, yeah. is the author of this book, uh, Ibn Tibbi on Reason and Revelation. It's actually a PhD uh, yes. dissertation. Which, uh, he insisted I read before I interview him, but it's very, very good, actually. Uh, OK, so he uh, actually, this is from that book. So. Yeah. He, he said that the various means of acquiring knowledge are for Ibn Taymiyyah. He says that for Ibn Taymiyyah, the various means of acquiring knowledge would be sensation, uh, true reports, khabar al-sadiq, self-evident axioms of reason, badiyat al-haq, sound inference, nadar hasan, various uh, incarnations of the mechanism of tawatur. He puts a lot of emphasis on concurrence of human beings um, because that, that reflects the fitra. You know, so the fitrah is showing through the concurrence of human beings. Yeah. The position of a, a sound cognitive moral disposition, which is fitrah salima, all stand objectively at every person's disposal, yet there are often numerous paths one can tread. Various corroborative combinations of these elements through which a person can attain knowledge. So... Uh, he's saying, do not limit knowledge. You know, if you're like empiricists would limit knowledge to just empirical findings and natives would imp uh, limit knowledge to the, you know, the, the innate uh, knowledge of the intellect. Uh, he said, do not limit knowledge. There are different ways of acquiring knowledge and they, they corroborate each other. They do not contradict each other. So if there is a truthful report, it should corroborate reason. Reason should corroborate it, and, and so on. Um, he, has a, he had an egalitarian epistemology. So uh, Professor Yahya Misho, uh, who's an Ibn Taymiyyah expert also, said that Ibn Taymiyyah fought to uphold the self-sufficiency of the religious rationality manifested in scriptural literality and common faith and its validity for all, the elite and the crowd. So it is one, basically, set of beliefs for the elite and the crowd, unlike yeah. the twofold truth. However, he does recognize, of course, he does recognize, and he mentions this so many times, that the depth of our beliefs, it's, it's the same direction, same direction, it's not opposite directions, you know, so, so the revelation is not pointing to do different beliefs and opposite directions, same direction, but the depth of your belief and the width of that belief may vary according to your competencies. And um, uh, uh, Dr. Muhammad Yunus Ali, in his uh, medieval Islamic pragmatics, he actually captures Ibn Taymiyyah's uh, language theory very well. Um, so that's why I... I mention all of them if, as resources for people who are interested in um, reading more about these issues. Um, so he, he says about Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, uh, what is discursive for a given person can thus be self-evident for another. Consequently, contrary to the traditional logic, uh, the middle term, which is al-Had al-Awsat, in the Aristotelian syllogism, you know, man would be al-had al awsat the middle term. So in the famous uh, sort of syllogism, you know, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, Socrates is mortal, man is al-had al awsat or the middle term. According to Ibn Taymiyyah, it could be dispensable for people who are exceptionally quick at conceptualizing propositions. So it is not always that they need al-had al awsat because what is discursive to be some people is necessary to others. Uh, depending on their competencies. So this is his co cognitive relativism. But he uh, basically wants to say that you do have different tools, including divine assistance. Uh, so even the public, they have different tools. And some of the tools that the public uh, may have uh, philosophers may not have. And the concept of ilham, for instance, divine assistance, 
is a concept that it's a very Sufi concept, but it is uh, a very Timaean concept also. Uh, he believes that uh, there is a role for divine assistance, divine inspiration. It's not like the revelation that we that is received through the angel, and it does not ha contradict it and may not contradict it. But he says when the seeker exerts effort in the clear Shara'i proofs, so you you try to find the truth through the clear Shara'i proofs, the Quran, the Sunnah, and the clear methodology of the Aimma, and finds no preponderance in favor of one opinion, and then is inspired with a preference uh, for one of the two actions while having good intention and consciousness of God, the inspiration of that person is evidence for them. It may be stronger than many weak analogies, weak hadith, and weak presumptions of continuity, which many of those involved in madhahib, comparative fiqh, and principles of jurisprudence use as evidence. So that is why, you know, the, the, the divine attributes is not only de dependent on discursive reasoning. It's not, it, it, there is a role for divine assistance here that is, that is extremely important for Imam Taymiyyah and for his most devout and loyal disciple, Imam Ibn al-Qayyim. So in Livnat Holtzman's words, according to Ibn al-Qayyim, the knowledge of God's attributes cannot be obtained by the human intellect alone and should not be acquired for mere intellectual purposes. Rather, the knowledge of God's attributes is the outcome of spiritual labor in which God participates actively by widening or opening the believer's heart to receive the meaning of the attributes. The heart therefore receives this knowledge directly from the niche of divine inspiration. Okay, so at, at uh, so he has, the, but in terms of termian epistemology, he says that it's varied, uh, multi multiple sources, they corroborate each other. At the center of them, is the concept of fitra, to the point where people call him the fitra philosopher. Hmm. Uh, that, so his definition of fitra would be the original spiritual, moral, cognitive disposition. Original hmm. spiritual, moral, cognitive disposition. The understanding of fitra is derived from the Prophet's statement. It's not something that he made up. No. So the Prophet wasallam said, every child is born on the fitra, and his parents convert him to Judaism, Christianity, or Magianism, or Zoroastrianism. Uh, but everybody is born on the fitra of Tawheed, uh, monotheism. The Quran affirms man's creation in the best of molds, he argues. So for him, fitra and reason, there is a relationship between fitra and reason. So the Badi'i knowledge, which is the self-evident, a priori, axiomatic knowledge, and the Daruri knowledge, which is the necessary and compelling realization, it's necessary and compelling in the sense that, like if I tell you one plus one equals what? You don't, there is no need for discursive reasoning. You capture this without thought, without investigation without thought and investigation. They used to say, for instance, you know, um, <laughs> nowadays may be different, uh, like human beings are uh, come in, in uh, two forms, like men and women or two genders, men and women. Mm -hmm. This is a necessary compelling uh, thought that does not require investigation. It's daruri, it's compelling. Uh, so all of the things that do not require investigation are considered sort of, uh, self-evident, um, but his, his fitra for him is wider than this. It's wider than the, the badihi knowledge. It is wider than the self-evident truths. Uh, it, it is the, the disposition that, that is both, that is, that is not only cognitive, but also spiritual and uh, moral. Um, moral objectiv objectivity, for instance, where is this coming from? Objective morality. Uh, between all human beings, you know, where is it coming from? That human concurrence, that kindness to the parents is a good thing. Cruelty to animals is a bad thing. There is human concurrence. Whether you believe in a religion or atheist, there is a human concurrence. 
Um, certainly, someone may say, no, I don't agree. But, but again, that exception would not matter because uh, that would be the extremely rare exception. And we know that la ibrata bin nadir, or extremely rare things are not considered in this discourse. So then he said he is very, very aware of the corruptibility of the fitra, the formations of the fitra. And he says that there are many reasons that the fitra could become corrupted. Uh, he, he mentions a lot of reasons, such as imitation, such as stubbornness, uh, uh, you know, uh, inherited uh, beliefs, uh, conjecture, uh, uh, bias, uh, uh, ulterior motives, and so on. What you need to do in order for you to not lose that important faculty is to rehabilitate your fitra. If you want to have a correct understanding of the divine attributes, uh, you need to rehabilitate your fitra because you will need it when you hear the divine uh, sort of uh, address. Uh, and whatever it is that you will capture will depend on salamat al-fitra, on the soundness of your uh, fitra. Um, and then he talks about affirming and acknowledging the creator is natural, necessary, and so on. Uh, this is quite busy, but I will not basically, uh, I just want to say that this is a statement uh, from Imam Taymiyyah about the role of reason, where he acknowledges the, diff the, the presence of two groups. On one side, there are some of the Sufis who uh, basically would find fault with reason and criticize reason, and the rationalist theologians on the opposite side who exaggerated in uh, the role of reason. And he says in the underlined here, reason is a necessary condition for the realization of knowledge, excellence and actions, and the perfection of both uh, knowledge and action. Uh, and he says that the states that are obtained without reason are incomplete and statements that contradict reason are invalid. He says the prophets brought things that reason cannot comprehend, not things that reason find impossible. He he has like a, a word that he says in Arabic, they, they come with maharat al-uqul, not maharat al-uqul. So they come with that which would bewilder you, not that is deemed impossible by reason. Uh, and uh, so he does recognize the, the importance of reason, and he says it has a certain domain. So that's why in his fiqh, he uses reason a lot, because that is the domain that reason needs to be used. You know, the divine attributes, that is a domain that, that reason is basically handicapped when it, you know, tries to conceptualize the unseen. Uh, so, so it does have still some place, but it has a limited place. But when it comes to the laws and, and fiqh and so on, uh, it should be used. So he says in the last statement here, some of the people of hadith may approach both sides, exaggeration and in, 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 uh, elevating reason and putting it down, both sides uh, at times by retiring, retiring reason from its domain or opposing the sunnah uh, with it. So... He says, in terms of reason and ghaib now, reason and the unseen, he says that the line between the ghaib, and the, uh, which is the unseen, and shahada, which is the seen, is impermeable, except, for, you know, for uh, the following. One, we can, through reason, recognize the existence of God and some of his attributes, uh, such as his, his life, his power, uh, his omnipotence, his omniscience, etc. Superior analogy applies. To him, superior analogy applies, meaning that every perfection that is existent in his creation, he's deserving of more of, more of it, of every perfection that's existed, every perfection that is not coupled with imperfection. Uh, he is deserving of it. He, he says that the fundamental axioms of reason cross over, fundamental axioms of reasons cross over to the unseen. So what is it that he will go to the uh, to basically discourse about un the unseen armed with the three laws? He would accept those. So law of identity, 
non-contradiction, excluded middle. He would accept those. He would add to them the fourth, the principle of sufficient reason, you know, cause and effect. Uh, and so he says that these do cross over. Otherwise, you could re use reason that is less definitive than this in dialectics, but not in basically conceptualizing God or not in making belief uh, or uh, understanding the, uh, the unseen. Um, and the most that he wants to do in dialectics with reason is to basically make holes in the rational arguments so that we can go, all go back and accept the scriptural arguments. Um, so in terms of the divine attributes, he thinks that we should not establish them through reason, although he recognizes that reason does basically exonerate God from all deficiency and attributes all perfection to him. But he says the principle in this matter is that Allah the exalted is described with what he has described himself with and with what his messenger uh, or messengers have described him with in affirmation and negation. But he also says the point to hear is that the affirmation of perfection and the negation of imperfection from Allah can be known through reason. You will not establish attributes, you will not call them attributes until you hear them from the revelation, but you can say that Allah's hearing and knowledge is an attribute of perfection, reason proves it, even before the revelation. And this is, uh, and I think that you had uh, discussed this before on one of your shows, so basically, uh, the, the concept of conflict between reason and revelation, mm -hmm. so you have, he says that it is, it is not a binary and that reason the, uh, is not all about definitive conclusions or definitive imports uh, or conclusive. And what matters is what's conclusive. It's not whether it's rational or scripture. Is it conclusive, definitive, tata'i? Or is it vanni, speculative, or inconclusive? So we will always privilege the conclusive over the inconclusive, whether it comes from reason or the revelation. But he argues that the conclusive, the, the conclusive uh, uh, from reason and conclusive from the revelation will never contradict. Okay, so Taimian ontology, which is extremely important also to his discussions, his hermeneutics and his discussions of the attributes. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, in Platonic ontology, you, you, you have a real existence of the universals in a realm uh, that is separate from the sensibles, the particulars. Yeah. So you have real existence, real ontological existence <laughs> of catness. And yeah. then you have, you have cat, 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 cat. Okay. They participate. So the, the, the universal inheres in all of these cats. Mm. This, is, this is going to be extremely important for the divine attributes. The, the universal inheres in all of these cats. But in Taimian nominalism or conceptualism, I would say, and I'm not going to get into the very exact type of his nominalism, um, he would. Um, he was a moderate nominalist, uh, but but is he a moderate nominalist, conceptualist? Probably a conceptualist. In 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 Taimian thought, there is nothing outside in the external reality except the particular cats, and the universal is only an abstraction, a mental abstraction that only exists in your mind only exists in your mind. There is no universal outside there. The universal, but you do capture something about this cat and that cat, and then you abstract from all of this, you know, the concept of catness. It's in your mind. The same applies to, to the different qualities you know, uh, to, 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 to all other qualities, all other attributes, you have basically abstracted them from the particulars and they are now in your mind. Uh, so only particular things exist, no forms exist in reality, 
Um, and, and he mentions that things that are in, par are in paradise, for instance, that, uh, that the statement from Abdullah ibn Abbas, that the only thing that is in common between this life and the hereafter and, and paradise uh, is the names. Mm. That is not to say, that is not to say that there will not be uh, fruits in the hereafter, for instance. Mm. But, but mm. The, 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 the similarity is such that you may say that they're, they're only names, you know, uh, but, but certainly that does not mean that Muslims don't believe that there will be the, these things in the hereafter. This is not a matter of disagreement now between Muslims, uh, whether the, these uh, are metaphors or, or not. All Muslims believe, all Sunni Muslims believe that the, these things are real. Hmm. So, Ibn Taymiyyah wanted to use the concept of nominalism to shift the paradigm from metaphysics to philosophy of language, affirming the coherence and comprehensibility of the scriptural language. He says, if it is said that the throne is an existent thing and mosquitoes are an existent thing, and people will say, how is he, why is he using this? You know, the difference between God and the creation is much greater than the difference between the throne and the mosquito. The Prophet ﷺ used the similar examples, you know, about the moon and, th and things like that. Uh, and how, you know, how we see the moon without being hurt by, by seeing the moon and, and things like that. This, this is not a comparison between God and the creation here. This is to tell us that the concept that we are having difficulty uh, about God or to ascribe, to attribute to God, we do have the, these differences even between the creatures. And we can use those examples not to liken God to any of the creatures, but basically to clarify the concept to the audience. So he says, if the throne is existent and the mosquitoes are existent also, no sane person would say that they are the same because they participated in the names thing and existent, shay and maujud. That's because there is nothing in the external world in which they participate. There are no forms in which the mos there is no form called existence in which the mosquito and the throne participate. Rather, the mind abstracts the universal concept, which is called an isman mutlaq or absolute name. And if it is said that this exists and that exists, then the existence of each one of them pertains to it uniquely. And others do not share in it, even though the name is a reality in each of them. So it's not metaphorical. So the existence of the mosquito is not metaphorical. Uh, uh, or the existence of the throne is not metaphorical, it's real for both. So one may say that this is the Platonic Platonic ontology, but not Aristotelian ontology, because Aristotle did not believe that forms have a separate existence, a separate ontological existence in a different realm. But he believed in their ontological existence, yet they subsist in sensibles not apart from them in a separate limb. So the same problems will, will apply also in, in the problem of composition, would apply also according to Aristotelian, Aristotelian ontology. Because those forms, you know, uh, or those universals, those kuliyat, every particular is composed of these kuliyat. So what, you know, Every man is composed of many kulliyat. There are certain universals that will apply to every man. We're all organisms. We all have sensation. We all have self-motion. And the, the distinctive uh, characteristic here is we're all rational. That separates us from animals, according to Aristotle. Then that, these universals, you add them up, and that makes human. You add to it tallness and you have a tall human, etc. So Ibn Taymiyyah says that particulars preceded the universals. The, the universals are abstractions and the mental conceptions. Uh, the particulars are not composed of universals. 
the universals are our mental abstractions from the particulars and there was nothing outside except the particulars. So, so, so why, is it, why is it important? Why is this important? Because when you say that God is also hearing and also this and also that, that in Aristotelian, in the Aristotelian sense, is a composition. You're bringing different universal here. The universal of hearing, the universal of mercy. These are different qualities. And you, now you're claiming that God is composed of those qualities. And if he's composed, he needs a composer. And if he is composed, his, his ipsity, his that, is in need of his power is in need of his knowledge, is in need of this and that. And that need would be unbefitting of the, the basit, undifferentiated that. They also have a problem with, you know, God's knowing of the particulars and all of that, uh, because that would be composition. And, and certain people suggested in different ways of reconciling between how is it that, uh, you know, and, and even the philosophers, they, they, they describe God by, by different names uh, because the, there is no existence outside, as Ibn Taymiyyah says, rahimahullah, that does not have qualities. It just doesn't happen. You don't have an existence without qualities. So his hermeneutics, um, now in his ontology, his hermeneutics, he, he, he was completely for a closed hermeneutical system that does not allow foreign discourses and philosophical contentions to rupture it. He believed that our system, hermeneutical system, already accounted for the place of reason. It already gave reason its right place. It's already accounted for. Uh, and the summary of his hermeneutics is affirmation in, in the divine attributes, affirmation of the primary meanings of the Quran and Sunnah as understood within their immediate and broader contexts of the revealed text and the linguistic conventions of the first audience using pure reason or clear reason, I may say, so that it's not confused with the critique of pure reason, using pure reason as a vital instrument. That's in summary, his hermeneutics. He wants to say that the primary meanings will be privileged, but the primary meanings are understood within their context. This is the immediate context and the broader context of the revelation. Another verse, another hadith. And within the linguistic conventions of the first audience, so you do not transfuse Islamic terminology with philosophical uh, definitions that are foreign to the linguistic conventions of the first audience. And then use pure reason as a vital instrument. Um, Muqaddama or Muqaddama fi usul al-Tafsir is basically a book that he wrote later in life. Uh, it has been explained by Dr. Akram al Nadwi. Uh, you know, he's in Britain. Um, and it, 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 it talks about a lot about uh, Taymane hermeneutics for people who are interested. And in terms of his language theory, uh, that particular book, Medieval Islamic Pragmatics, uh, it's a Routledge Arabic linguistic series uh, publication. Uh, and it's the PhD of, uh, of uh, Dr. Muhammad Yunus Ali. Uh, it, it talks about uh, about his contextual language theory. So in order for us to understand the relations between utterances and meanings uh, and how the divine attributes uh, apply here, or how this applies to the divine attributes, in, in Arabic, you have this division. So you have something called tawata, which is concordance. So when you say human, it applies to all humans equally. You have tashakuk, which is difference in degree. That's gradable expressions. When you say white, it applies to different white things differently. So ivory is called white, for instance. You know, it may be called off-white in one language, but in Arabic, it would be called white. Uh, ice would be called white. Uh, even light would be called white, etc. So when you, uh, so that is gradable. That is 
That is what Ibn Taymiyyah will use to say that the divine attributes apply in this sense um, to God and to us, difference and degree. There is a distinct measure and there is a shared measure. But the shared measure, the, 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 the distinction between God and uh, creature is not only quantitative, it is qualitative. Then we have the concept of tahaluf or tabayun. So book and horse apply to different things, you know, so different words for different meanings. The first one, one word that applies similarly to, to every, to all the objects. Second, one word applies differently in grade to different objects. Third, uh, is disjunction, book and horse, the, the different words and different meanings. Uh, fourth is called shirak, homonymy. So that's like the bark of a tree and the barking of a dog. It's bark and bark, but they are completely unrelated. So in Arabic, the word the ayn is the common example that's used. Ayn in Arabic would refer to the eye, gold, spring, uh, like water spring, uh, spy, all of these would be called I. Um, so that's homonymy. And some people say that the divine attributes apply to God, you know, the, the, they belong to this category. This is only basically participating in the word and not participating in any meaning, which will eventually mean that they don't mean anything when we uh, use them for God. So mercy does not mean anything uh, because it's, it's nothing that we have ever experienced. So then you have the concept of taraduf, which is synonymy, like happy and glad, for instance. Um, the concept of polysemy in Arabic would be nakl, but this would come under homonymy. Even though polysemy, nakl means what? To transfer. You use the, you use the word first for a, for a particular referent, and then you transferred the use to something else, some other referent or some other meaning. So bank, for instance. So the, 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 the commonality between the bank of the river and the bank as, the, as in the financial institution is that both store and keep things, you know, with our water or your money uh, records, etc. So that's polysemy, not homonymy, because there is something uh, in common between the two references, even though it's extremely remote. So there is then uh, what Ibn Taymiyyah uh, says is that the participation, when we say God exists and we exist, when we say God is merciful, and the prophet was merciful. Uh, when we say, uh, whatever it is, the, the attributes of God, God hears and we hear. He has knowledge and we have knowledge. The participation here, is this participation lovely in the sense of the verbal, word, the wording, so homonymy, or is there ishtarak ma'anawi? Analogical signification, conceptual commonality, shared semantic content, different translations for the, the concept of ishtarak ma'anawi. Is there a meaning that you can capture that's in common, that you can capture? Because otherwise you can't conceptualize it if you've never, if you have no familiarity with it. If it doesn't refer to anything that you're familiar with, you can't conceptualize it. So Ibn Taymiyyah says it is ishtarak ma'anawi. There is something that you can capture in terms of meaning. It is not that we are using that word for God and for us uh, for completely different meanings that would be like homonymy, would be like, you know, Ayn referring to gold and referring to eye and spring and spy. No, that's not true. If we do say that, it will mean that we don't know anything about God and that the revelation never told us anything about God. 
because it's it's all homonymy. If it is homonymy, we cannot translate them. Ibn Taymiyyah believes that we can translate them, and we may come to this discussion shortly. So, in his contextual language theory, single expressions don't mean anything. So, if you if single expressions are not meant to mean anything. He says that languages are not designed to signify the meanings of single expressions. It's all contextual because the same word may mean different things in different contexts. Uh, and there is no haqiqa and majaz to him. There is no basically uh, allegorical, there is no haqiqi and majazi uh, for, for Ibn Taymiyyah. There is no need for that distinction. The people who make the distinction between Hakiki and Majazi, he answers them by saying, if you say lion is Hakiki uh, when it refers to the animal, and it is Majazi when it refers to a brave man, you will need to prove, you will need to prove that language was developed by people having like several meetings where they first met and decided to use the word lion for the animal. So that became the haqiqi, the first use by wada, the first wada, or the first establishment of the meaning. And then they had another meeting and they said, well, we will describe brave men uh, with that term. So basically, Anyone who can prove that chronologically will be able to prove that there is Hakiti and Majazi. And he, he, he argues that it may that the opposite may be very true, that people first were meeting uh, each other before they met uh, lions, and they may have uh, used the word lion to describe the animal because of something in the word that made them use it. And then when they saw the lion, they used it for that animal afterwards. So he says that this is not uh, enough to justify the distinction between Hakiki and uh, Majazi. So when people say the distinction between Hakiki and Majazi uh, is not only based on this, but it is based on what first comes to your mind when the word is mentioned. When they say that it, it, you know, if the word is mentioned outside of any context, uh, the meaning of the word outside of any context is the haqiqi. He says that there is no such thing. Like if someone says lion, that doesn't mean anything. It's not meaningful. It's not a meaningful expression. As the, 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 uh, you know, it could be, it could be wise uh, to alert people to the presence of a lion but it does not mean anything in and of itself. But then uh, people say that what, what, what is uh, basically the, the word without any context refers to the haqiqi meaning and within a context what refers to a majazi meaning, he will say there is no use of words except within a context. So when you say, I saw, I heard a lion speaking from the pulpit. No, you know, the, the primary meaning would be a brave man. There is no way that anyone will think that you're talking about the animal. Uh, anyway, uh, atherism is not dependent on Taymiyyan denial of Hariqi and Majazi. There are atheries, and I'll have to, to just uh, uh, forward to this slide here to tell you, that uh, someone like Imam ibn Abdul Barr, rahimahullah, he, ha he, he believes in the distinction between Hakiki and Majazi, but he says that these attributes are Hakiki, are real, uh, when it comes to God. And they don't mean the, the necessary concomitants that you uh, ascribe to them. So we believe that death comes to us in truth, he says. Imam ibn Abdul Barr, he says that when we say that وَجَاءَ رَبُّكَ and your Lord has come, uh, you're saying that this is corporealist. 
we are saying that he comes in truth, haqiqat and not majaza, not metaphorically. But we're also saying that death comes to us in truth. So the Quran also uses the maji or the coming for death. So is this a body? No, it's not. So just like we use that here, we use we're using it there. It's both it's literal here and there. So I just wanted to say that you know atherism is not really dependent on that denial of distinction between hakika and majaz, and this may be a Taymian thing, although some linguists had corroborated or had agreed to that proposition. In the past, as Sheikh Al-Qumari, for instance, mentions that he's, he's, he's not alone. Uh, and if, you know, um, Sperber and Wilson, uh, these are the champions of the relevance theory. They say that there are already strong grounds for rejecting the notion of figurative meaning. It's all contextual. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah comes with this concept of mushakkik or gradable expressions. You know, it's not that he comes up with this concept, but he uses the concept of mushakkik, gradable expressions, to say that the language is flexible already that the language does recognize that the, 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 the words capture a wide spectrum of meanings. The words do not refer to every referent exactly, but the words in our language would, would capture a wide spectrum of meaning. Like how many words do we have for the different colors, for instance? Uh, finite, but but can we make the distinction, you know, in any language between that color, be, be, between all the different colors and all different shades of color? No. So the, the words are just used to capture a scope, like a spectrum of meanings. And what they mention in the lexicons is basically what the, the common usage of people what the, what they define, however, they define words and lexicons through the common usage of people. Some of them, some of the lexicographers would basically give a primary meaning to every word and some of them use the, the not the etymology, but rather the shared meaning in the word and consider this to be primary. Like a Johari, for instance, he would say that the word Bahr, which would mean sea, or mean a horse with wide steps, uh, or mean a scholar with immense knowledge. The word Bahr is not literal for the sea, the body of water, and metaphoric for the others. It is literal for something that's wide, that's huge, that's immense. And then it applied to all of those uh, particulars. Uh, why, is he, why is he trying to say all of this? He's again trying to say that using the, the, these words to describe the divine does not necessarily, in truth, does not necessarily entail assimilation. So the, the shared measure, he says that there is a shared measure and a distinct measure between any two things. So hearing is not a homonym. There is a shared measure, you know, recognition of sounds and a distinct measure. We thought we spoke about it, sound waves and stuff. That's distinct, it doesn't have to apply. Any two things have a shared measure. They are a thing and they are existent, if we're talking about existent things. Uh, they are a thing and they are existent. Um, the shared measure or commonality is only a conceptual notion in the mind and has no extra mental reality. So the ishtarak or participation is only in the mind. So when we say that God 
is merciful and there are humans who are merciful, the prophet was merciful. This is shtarak, participation in this meaning is only in the mind. Outside the mind, there is no participation whatsoever because there is neither forms that in here in the different particulars, there is neither a form that's called mercy or a universal that has a real ontological existence that's called mercy that inheres in the particular in the different particulars, nor is there an ontological reality to that concept as away from the particulars. Uh, so he uses like, for instance, to, to prove that there is a shared meaning, uh, that there, there are many proofs, there are hundreds of proofs in the Quran and Sunnah, when Allah uses the word Arham al-Rahameen, the most merciful of the merciful, can he, can this be uh, homonymy? Can, the, can, can his Rahma and our Rahma be completely different things? But yet he's saying he's the mer most merciful of the merciful. Can the first word merciful mean something completely different from the second word merciful? He says, of course not. So every time Allah says he's more knowledgeable, he's more powerful, he uses af'al al comparative superlative, that means that there is a shared meaning. So the distinct measure, again in the same book that you have uh, next to you, Reason, Revelation, and the Reconstitution of Rationality. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that one. <laughs> Yeah, that one. yeah, that. Yeah. Do highly recommend it. Do read it. Absolutely fascinating. Yeah. So, uh, so it's uh, he says, uh, Doctor Tobgi says, it is uh, these four fundamental qualities: uh, necessity versus contingency, eternality versus temporality, perfection versus deficiency, indestructibility versus destructibility. That for Ibn Taymiyyah define the haqiqa or fundamental essence of any existing thing. Mm. Every attribute outside is colored by them, inseparable from these distinction. Uh, it follows that whatever attributes an entity possesses apply to it in a manner commensurate with the entity's underlying ontological reality as determined by this limited set of crucial traits. So how did he answer the, the, the sort of the accusation of assimilation? Uh, certainly he, th there, is, there is much in terms of textual proofs, but this is a, a statement from Imam Tirmidhi where he was talking about how the Jahmis, uh, they say that the Yad means uh, the power or the hand means power and so on. They reinterpret the attributes of God in a way that the predecessors did not interpret them. And then he says that Ishaq ibn Ibrahim said, he approvingly reports from Ishaq ibn Ibrahim that the shbi is when you said likening God to the creation is when you, one says, hand like my hand or similar to my hand or he hearing like my hearing or similar to my hearing, then this is the shbi. But if one says what Allah has said, hand, hearing, seeing, and does not speak of modality, nor does he say, like my hearing, then it is not tashbih or assimilation. It is what Allah, the most blessed and most high, said in his book, there is none like unto him, and he is the hearing, and uh, the all hearing and the all seeing. So that's the, the concept of tashbih according to the predecessors. Um, what they what they later tried to do is basically say that if you describe him as existent and you describe us as existent, that is assimilation. That's likening him to us. And that would have never made any sense to the predecessors because ultimately it amounts to denial of God. So Imam Taymiyyah says here, if it is said that the necessary and the contingent participate in the name of existence, and self-subsistence, 
and that both of them are living, knowledgeable and capable. Whatever is possible for one of them is possible for the other. It would be said, they are not alike in this matter in which they participated. What is established for God in this regard is not like what is established for the created being. And if it is said that they participate in this matter, then this means that they participate in the absolute universal, which does not exist in its absoluteness except in the mind, not in the external world. And whatever each of them has of this is specific, unique to them and not shared by others. And this shared thing, common measure, does not imply any deficiency. So if we say that at the end of the day, there has to be a common measure, there has to be a shared measure. So uh, in order for this not to be simply homonymy, you would have to say that they participate in a shared meaning. That shared meaning, which is in the mind, does not imply any deficiency. So if we say hearing is the recognition of sounds, and yes, they do participate in the recognition of sounds, that does not uh, imply any deficiency of our imperfection to God. Then, then he, he stresses the fact that avoiding likening completely amounts to the denial of God. Uh, because, you know, avoiding likening is not just, and, 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 and he ma makes a very important observation that uh, to avoid likening God to the cre creations is not merely about the negating things of God, as the Jahmis, he says, imagine, but mainly about affirming God's true names and attributes. So the more you affirm the true names and attributes of God, the more you distinguish God from the creation, the more you embrace his greatness and his difference, the more you distinguish him from the creations. And Imam Ahmed, um, he made this uh, uh, observation in, in one of his books, or response to the Jamis and uh, the Zanadiqa uh, heretics. Uh, it's a book by Imam Ahmed. He said, we said, he is a thing. God is a thing, he means. They replied, he is a thing, but not like other things. So it would be important to know that he's not like other things. But to, to, to uh, deny sameness is absolutely right in every respect. But to deny that, the, the, uh, that God and uh, the creatures could be like each other in some respects, is impossible. So to say that God and the creatures are not like other each other in any respect, then you're saying that God does not exist. So we said the thing which is not like other things in any respect, the people of reason have recognized it as nothing. At that point, it became clear to the people, Imam Ahmad says that they are, uh, they don't believe in anything. Anyway. So that is, that's the concept that atheists want to basically uh, drill in everybody, that you cannot run away. You can, if you run away, you will always have to run away farther. If you run away uh, from affirmation, uh, you, you either reach the very end or you will be contradictory. And the very end is basically denial of God. Uh, or you will be contradictory and the contradiction will uh, be pointed out by the people who are next to you uh, in or, or, or more extreme than you in uh, negationism. So uh, the, the, the issue of corporealism, spatialism and uh, directionality and divisibility. So there are uh, basically, the, t the first I mean response that we have to start with is the denial of tajsim. The word the jism in Arabic is completely inappropriate of God. However, I will say now why he was, as Professor Hoover says, anti-anti-corporealist. Not corporealist, but anti-anti-corporealist. And I will say why. But the Taymiyyah response is, 
it, when it comes to the tafsim, if it is about the tafsim, if it is about the, the word in Arabic, what this word in Arabic means, we absolutely, absolutely exonerate God from being a body. A jism in Arabic. So he says, most of Ahl Sunnah of our Mazhab and others accuse the assimilationist Mushabbiha and Mujassima, which sometimes you will have to translate as corporealists. But we will talk about why I used, I, I made it clear. Because Mujassima in Arabic, in the conventions of the first audience, means body in the sense of body, like this body, like this body, like body like this. Um, so Imam Taymiyyah goes on, so, so Imam Taymiyyah provingly said that our people from our madhab and from the rest of Ahlul Sunnah, they accuse Mujassima of this belief. And he approvingly said that. But then he said, however, this person erred when he thought that this is the meaning of the apparent meaning of these verses and hadith. The apparent meaning is that which comes to the sound mind, which is important here. Imam Taymiyyah does not say any primary meaning that comes to any mind. No, the apparent meaning that is intended is what comes to the sound mind. The sound mind had a primer of tanzih already, had a primer of tanzih already, exoneration of God. The sound mind that knows the greatness of God, the incomparability of God, the transcendence of God, is what's going to capture the right meaning from these verses, which comes to the sound mind of those who understand that language. It may be apparent by default or because of the context. These innovated meanings that are impossible to pertain to Allah, exalted as he, are not the meanings that come first to the mind of believers. Nay, the hand to them is like the knowledge, the power, and the ipsaity. As much as our knowledge, power, speech, and other attributes are arad, accidents, indicating our hudus, temporal origination, that are unbefitting of Allah, deemed as he above all deficiencies, likewise, our hands and faces are at sam, bodies, which are also temporal, and it is impossible for Allah, exalted as he, to be described by that. So it seems that he's very clear on this, that the word body, as it refer as it is used by in the language, does not apply to God. And when he says the attribute, when he says the attributes are arad, accidents, that's that's a translation, the common translation. But arad in Arabic would mean changes that are defective. You know, disease is arad, for instance. Uh, weakness, uh, sleep, uh, things of that nature are considered arad in Arabic. So why some people describe Ibn Taymiyyah's theology as anti-anti-corporealist? Because he would certainly, he is, it's clear that he's denying uh, corporealism here in the first statement. But look at what he says here. He says the intellectuals have used, and another, the intellectuals have used the term al-jism, the body, in a more general sense than its linguistic meaning, just as they have done with the terms al-jawhar, the substance, al-arad, the accident, al-wujud, existence, and that essence, and others. They use the term al-jism to refer to that which exists independently and can be pointed to, and that can be qualified by attributes. So attribute, so, so basically philosophically, during their time, everything that is existent has to be one of two things, jawhar, substance, arad, accident, movement and stillness, color, these are what? These are arad, these are accidents. There has to be a jawhar in which these arad subsist. The jawhar stands independently, exists independently, subsists independently, but the arad needs a jawhar to, to exist or to subsist. So they used 
they would refer to anything that subsists independently as a jism now, a body. So if you deny that God is a jism in that sense, so God does not basically exist or subsist independently, cannot be pointed to, and cannot be described by qualities, cannot have qualities. Because if he is an accident, if he is a mental abstraction, that can, you know, qualities cannot subsist in that. So that was his great hesitation of negating uh, divine corpus. Uh, but then he says, saying that Allah is a body or not a body, Jawhar substance or not a substance, spatially located or not, has a direction or not, originated events supervene in his essence, the Hulli fihi al or not, all of this is innovated by the people of Kalam and the Salaf and Imams never spoke about these things, neither by negation or affirmation. Contrarily, they used to condemn these uh, or those who, sp who speak like that concerning God, exalted is he. So he doesn't want to use it. Uh, he doesn't want this to be part of the uh, discourse, neither in affirmation or negation. But when, you're, when it is clear what you mean by jism, and it is clear that you mean by jism, the linguistic meaning in the con linguistic convention of the first audience that received the Quran, he would say, no, Allah is not a jism in this sense. So here is here is what you know the, the divine corpus, the existence of a divine corpus mm. is that is that objectionable by the fitra of man? No, you you have someone like Mullah Sadra, which I used before, and people thought that I I am using is I am using this critically of Mullah Sadra, uh, but you have someone as Arfani, uh, spiritual and philosophical as Mullah Sadra, who is a watershed figure, uh, certainly in the Shi'i tradition, not in the Sunni tradition, but in the Shi'i tradition, but generally uh, Muslims who are interested in theology and, and philosophy and spirituality, they, they read Mullah Sadra, and I read Mullah Sadra uh, as, as one of the watershed figures in our history. He put forth the concept of a divine body that is totally distinct from all other bodies yet shares with them the characteristic of dimensionality. This aspect of his philosophy has certainly caused criticism by some Shia uh, maraja, uh, like uh, Sheikh Sayyid al Khoui, uh, and uh, caused some of them to actually excommunicate him. Mm. Uh, because the Shia tradition has been thoroughly transfused with the Mu'tazili discourse. There was yeah some the sort of earlier affinity between the Shia and the Mu'tazila, uh, and the Shia tradition is thoroughly transfused with the Mu'tazili discourse, or at least uh, the contemporary uh, one. So of course, Mullah Sadra negated Jismiyya in many places in his writings, he negated Jismiyya as in the language, but what he negated is different from what he affirmed. There is a semantic shift here between what he proposed uh, and what he negated. If you're talking about Jismiya in the sense of the, the, the how the word was used at the time of the revelation, no, we negate that. Uh, but there is no problem in affirming a divine corpus, which you may say a divine independent existence uh, that has real ontological reality and certainly Sadrians would disagree with uh, uh, ascribing dimensionality, but this is what many people that are not Sadrians uh, understand from his uh, statement when he divided the bodies, when he said that, you know, the, the characteristic of body is dimensionality, and then he divided the bodies and said that there is no problem in affirming a divine body uh, that's unlike all bodies. Uh, so, so, so anyway, 
he also pointed out that it is necessary for empiricists to have to believe uh, in in God. So now that we are saying that you know the, the existence of a divine sort of corpus or independent existence, which we are not saying, because that is not what the revelation said, and we will just stick to the revelation. But the point in mentioning this is to say that this is not something that is rejected by uh, the fitra, the human fitra. Uh, for, forget about what they call the masses. Well, of course, Mullah Sadra is not the masses. Uh, so where is this concern, this heightened obsession about corporealism? Hmm. Uh, where is it coming from? Because the Kalam cosmological argument it, it is proving the, the, the beginning of this world by the fact that uh, these are bodies and bodies had a beginning because bodies have accidents subsist in them and accidents alternate. So accidents have a beginning, bodies have a beginning, you know, and therefore uh, the world has a beginning. So anything that will come in the way of this will have to be removed. Uh, so, so, but but then, then corporealism was set because we used all of these arguments to prove the second premise of the Kalam cosmological argument, which can, which can be proved by other arguments, whether they are complicated philosophical arguments or more sort of uh, natural arguments, badi arguments. Uh, but we use those complicated arguments. So corporealism now is a necessary concomitant of composition, directionality and spatiality, and new events subsisting in, subsisting in God. So composition will mean, but this is not according to the rational theologians in terms of the Maturidis and Ash'aris, but the Mu'tazilis. Composition will mean corporealism to the Mu'tazilis. Directionality and spatiality, spatiality uh, will mean uh, corporealism to the Mu'tazilis and the rational theologians uh, from the Sunni tradition. New events subsisting in God will also point to corporealism because, you know, new events subsist in Ajsam. So if we say that new events subsist in him, then he is a just or he is a body or a corpus. So uh, Imam Ibn Taymiyyah exonerated God from the false meanings while rejecting the necessary concomitants. Terminal, and he rejected the terminological shifts also. And he rejected that there is any deficiency in what Atharis affirm to God. Atharis affirm that he has attributes. Uh, he has the essence and the attributes. That's composition according to the Mu'tazizila. Atharis affirm that he's above the throne. That's directionality according to the Mu'tazila and other rational theologians. Atharis say that he does whatever he pleases, whenever he pleases his volitional attributes, uh, they affirm his volitional attributes, and that constitutes new events subsisting in him according to the rational theologians. Uh, so uh, basically, rejection of the necessary concomitants, uh, this is not only so something that uh, Imam Taymiyyah started, this is this is old. So Imam Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari, in his third phase, uh, he, he was very, very clear on this. We reject all the necessary concomitants. So why did you, Imam Abu Hassan Ash'ari, in his book, Al-Ibana, uh, uh, and this is one of his last books, that's why Imam Taymiyyah says, whoever follows Imam Abu Hassan Ash'ari in his book, Al-Ibana, is of Ahl Sunnah. It's not like I want, you know, followers. Don't follow me. Follow Imam al Hassan Ash'ari in his book Al-Ibana, but don't contradict it. And then you will be, I will consider you of Ahl Sunnah. So Imam al Hassan Ash'ari says here, why did you assert, he is saying to the you know negationists, why did you assert that if the hand is not a favor, then it must be a limb? They refer us to our empirical experience. 
So uh, he answers them by saying, we have not found a living being among the creations except that it is of flesh and blood. So will you deny God's life? Because all, in our empirical experience, living things are all common flesh and blood. So, uh, so he says at the end of the statement, if you instead affirm that God is a living being, not like any other living being among us, then why do you deny that the two hands that Allah the Exalted has mentioned are neither favors nor limbs and are unlike all other hands? So no assimilation, no corporealism. So that's the important concept of rejecting the necessary concomitance, because even if it is necessary concomitance in our empirical experience, that does not cross over to the unseen. Whatever crosses over to the unseen are the 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 the, 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 the three laws and uh, the principle of sufficient reason. So uh, then the concept of composition. So Imam Taymiyyah wants to answer the concept of uh, composition. He says that there is no universals in existence, no divisibility in God. God is, with, is without any need, no existent without qualities. So the Aristotelian notion of simple, basit, undifferentiated, composition, universals, etc. So to the Mu'tazila, not to the Ash'aris and Maturidis, this was a valid argument. That's why they had to deny the attributes so that God is not composed of the Ipsaity and the attributes. So Liram Taymiyyah said, no universals in existence to compose you know, particulars from, so that we say that God was composed of this and this. We got some mercy for him from that universal. We got some you know, uh, hearing and, and, and so on. No divisibility in God and no existent without qualities. Uh, so what Tarkib are you talking about? If you're talking about Tarkib in the sense of divisible bodies that you know can be chopped off, no one had said this about God. And no one in his right mind would say that the that that is described by life, knowledge, hearing, etc., that this means uh, a divisible that. There is no existence out there that is not described by attributes. And then, uh, so this is my, my statement. I explain in my wording, my, his position, that we agree that a perfect unity is not compatible with quantitative or aggregate unity. We agree that the perfect one cannot be of this, this soluble nature subject to disintegrative or augmentative change. This is not what they meant by Tarkib. This is not what they meant by Tarkib. Imam Taymiyyah agreed, no divisibility, no disunion in God. He said, when he explained the Samadiyyah, Allahu Samad, Samad, Samadiyyah of Allah, self-sufficiency, even if the created being may be Samad in certain aspects or respects, the reality of Samadiyya does not exist in them since they are subject to disunion and divisibility and are also dependent on others. So uh, he, he clearly denies, and you will see here a denial of the, the, the God, you know, the hand, the face, or anything of the, like this, meaning limbs or organs. Uh, nothing in the apparent meaning of the phrase that suggests that it refers to what is specific to the creatures, such as limbs or organs. Okay, so direction and space. So this is the, the, the concept of composition. We're done with the concept of composition. No, God is not composed in that sense, but you cannot say that the, the uh, uh, attribution of qualities to the essence of God is a form of composition that's only in your Aristotelian mind or Platonic uh, mind of uh, real universals. Uh, direction and space. 
so one of the major contentions is is God above the throne, uh, and direction and space would mean to rational theologians corporealism, and they have a chain of basically links here. So here is the chain. or aboveness and istiwa entail directionality, jiha. Directionality, jiha, entails spatial locatedness, the high use. Spatial locatedness, the high use, entails corporealism, that seem. Corporealism, that seem, entails divisibility and qisam and composition, tarkib, and divisibility and qisam and composition, tarkib, entail temporal origination, hudus. So you would then understand why they think that anyone who says that God is above the throne has committed this belief, because going through these links, you eventually you're eventually saying the lazim, the necessary concomitant of your belief in the aboveness, is that God is temporal and has a beginning. So. The, the, the main response is to basically say he, he, he wants to simply, uh, and that is why, you know, the, the recent writing of Professor Hoover, and I don't blame him because he, he even said he, when he described the Temean. Now, yeah, not that book, the, the book where right. he talked about the spatial. Uh, Yeah. No, I just want to mention that this this is an excellent general yeah. introduction, a critical work by a leading uh, Western scholar, professor of Islamic studies at the University of Nottingham here in England. Um, yeah, I just I recommend it as a good primer. Uh, anyway, yeah, yeah, but but, but when when he when he talked about Ibn Taymiyyah's position on spatial extension, mm. uh, you know, of God, uh, he he himself, Professor Hoover himself, said that using the terminology of Al-Razi, Ibn Taymiyyah is likely saying this, the gist of his of what he said. But Ibn mm -hmm. Taymiyyah would not be caught dead saying you know, <laughs> these words. So anyway, mm -hmm. but but at any rate, uh, so what, what Ibn Taymiyyah wanted to do is to, to make holes in the, that chain so that we can go back and believe that God is above the throne. Mm -hmm. um, Uh, that's at the end of the day what he wants. Um, but it's not only Ibn Taymiyyah. In fact, the commentator, and the commentator is Averroes, Ibn Rushd. You know, the, the, so, so he is Sharah. Um, they call him Sharah. Well, he is the one who wrote, wrote the, the most sort of significant commentaries on Aristotle's uh, philosophy in the Middle Ages. Um, so the commentator is not dumb. Uh, or um, I think that you would not say that the commentator is 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 mentally deficient. Mm. And according to the commentator, uh, this this chain is is completely broken in the, in different in different links. It's completely broken. So he believes that God's aboveness, uh, which is said to entail directionality, does not necess necessitate the uh, high use spatial locatedness and corporealism. So, so Professor Hoover said that Ibn Taymiyyah drew on Aristotelian notion, the Aristotelian notion of space in these counter arguments. So all things in the world are surely existing in spaces. However, the world as a whole is not because spatially extended objects are not dependent on the space they occupy. Spatial extension subsists in the object or body itself And it depends upon the body for its existence. The body does not need independently existing space, but space derives from the body. There is no such thing like space without bodies. So outside of the world, the whole world, the whole universe, there is no space. Space is a relation between me and you. Location or direction may indicate a relation between two things, but the relation has no real existence. That's Ibn Taymiyyah now saying all of this. So location or direction may indicate a relation between two things, but the relation has no real existence of its own. God's aboveness is a relation between God and the world. It does not mean that God needs space or location. 
that he is located in in a, in a particular uh, space. And he goes on to saying, anyone who describes God with attributes similar to those of the creatures is definitely in error. This is like someone who claims that God descends, so he travels from one place to another, like a human descending from the roof to the lower level of a house, or like someone who says that the throne is vacated of God, so his descent is a vacating of one place and occupying another. All of this is false, and God must be exonerated from such descriptions as mentioned earlier. But this is this is interesting because one of the things that one of the you know sort of the most recalcitrant lies that keep on uh, coming back is the is um, what's attributed to Ibn Battuta, and Ibn Battuta did not write his book. He was an explorer. He was the Marco Polo of, you know, uh, the Muslim world. Uh, so he was an explorer, and he, uh, in, in, in his book, uh, his, his journey, uh, which was not written by him, it was written by someone after him, uh, he said that Ibn Taymiyyah uh, was on the minbar and said that God descends like this, and he stepped down, he, you know, one step uh, on the minbar. Uh, and this would be completely, utterly nonsensical. You know, the person who's saying this cannot be doing that in Damascus, where he was not the khatib of the masjid <laughs> to begin with. And when Ibn Battuta entered Damascus, he was in prison. And if he had ever said that, he would not have been left alone. You know, why is it that only Ibn Battuta is mentioning this? Did Ibn Taymiyyah have any scarcity, scarcity of opponents mm -hmm. and adversaries to make this uh, the hugest deal and the, you know, the hugest accusation against them? So, of course, this is a, a, a complete lie. The, the answer is what he said in his book. So, and he also says about the throne, it's all, it's important to understand that when the predecessors and imams say that Allah is above the throne and the heavens and, uh, 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 and the heavens and above all things, they are not implying that something contains him or limits him in any way, or that he occupies a specific space or vessel. On the contrary, Allah is above all things independently while all things are dependent on him. He is higher than all things and carries, upholds the throne and its carriers through his power and might. So that one does not think that the throne carries God. No, God carries this throne. And then he gives different examples, you know, that would make it uh, clear. Uh, he gives the example of paradise, for instance. Uh, Ibn Abbas saying there is nothing in, in paradise from what is in the world except for the names. Basically, the, uh, you know, his nominalism may be actually inspired by this. Uh, and then he gives the example of the spirit. He says that we ascribe attributes to the spirit like descending, ascending. You know, in the revelation, the spirit uh, is described as descending and ascending and seeing and hearing and all of that. Does that uh, uh, necessitate or entail corpor corporealism? No, it shouldn't, at least in the sense of most of the, uh, uh, you know, Arab, most people, uh, the, the Arabs who first received the revelation, the spirit is not a body in, the, in, their, uh, in their definition. He also uses the, the wing of humidity, and Ibn al-Qayyim uses the wing of humidity. They say, you know, lower the wing of humility to your parents. What does that mean? Is the wing of humility metaphorical? They say, no, it's not metaphorical. It's a wing. It doesn't have feathers. <laughs> but humility has a wing. It doesn't have feathers. But there is a relationship between the wing of humility and the wing of the bird and my wing. My wing is my side. Uh, so I lower it, meaning I, 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 when I approach my parents, I basically bring my sort of body together. Uh, 
not spread my chest like this, for instance. So it's, it's like a sign of uh, humility. So there is a relationship between the wing of humidity and the wing of the bird that makes this wing of humidity not metaphorical. First of all, he didn't have metaphorical and literal, uh, but he said that should not, you should not say that th this is anything less than true. Uh, so what did he mean by the hands then? If you deny, if he denies that the hands of God are limbs, tools, appendages, uh, divisible parts, what do you mean by them? So the discussion is not only about the hands. We have to first say that. The discussion is about the mercy of God, the love of God. Because rational theologians would say that the mercy cannot mean mercy. Because what mercy means is unbefitting of God. The mercy would mean the will to reward or the will to favor, but it does not mean mercy. Love does not mean love, because what love means, what the definition of love, the lexical definition of love is not befitting of God. Anger does not mean anger, because what definition of anger does not befit God. It's the boiling of the blood in the heart that causes certain conditions. So he denies that, that these lexical definitions or philosophical definitions are you know, uh, the definitions basically restrict the use of these words uh, in any way, shape, or form. Um, so, and, and he said that uh, the lexical philosophical definition will not suit God even concerning the agreed upon attributes among all Sunni Muslims. So here are some definitions of will, irada the inclination of the self and its tendency towards action. Belief in benefit or expectation of it resulting in an inclination. All of this is, is, is inappropriate for God, it is unsuitable. So at the end of the day, if you will say will that is not like our will, say, you know, mercy that's not like our mercy, love that's not like our love, hand that's not like our hand, everything. So then the interlocutor may say, so still, what do you mean by the hands? If, if they are not divisible parts, if they are not appendages, if they are not limbs, what do you mean by them? The first response is, it's a bad question because, uh, because of the incapacity of human language. It is, you, you're trying to, to cause me distress and hardship. That's the intent of the question because our predecessors did not do this. That language may not be may not have the capacity to describe all things or to define all things. Can we name all colors? Can we find the perfect match for every word in our translations? Like if you translate from English to Arabic, if you translate from Arabic to English, uh, there are words in Arabic that you will not find the perfect match in English. The same applies to the, the, the opposite. There are words in English that you know. I am a native Arabic speaker. You know, there are many times where I have difficulty translating from English to Arabic, to my native language, because yes, there are certain words that I can't, that I can't find the perfect match for. So which definition are you looking for? The Aristotelian definition? Ibn Taymiyyah wrote a whole book on the Aristotelian definition and how it does not help us with conceptualization of things that we have not already conceptualized. Uh, are you looking for the lexical definition? Well, the lexical definition is limited. They basically, uh, it, it's all dependent on our human experience of things. Uh, so, so our usage of the language, God used the language that we have made to basically tell us about things that we cannot apprehend, but he found this language, he found words in this language suitable to describe in, in, to, to, to make things sort of close to our comprehension, somewhat close to our comprehension, while affirming that we will certainly not comprehend uh, everything. So, so uh, still, what do you mean by the hands? The, the righteous predecessors said, it's explanation is reading it, read it. 
That's what it means. Al istwa ghayr majhul. The hand is not unknown. Just like, you know, the istwa is not unknown. Read it. That's what it means. What you will capture, so what is the benefit of affirmation? Because you will capture things by not denying it, by affirming it, you will capture many things. You will say that this is the wheel, this is reinterpretation. No, it's not, because we're affirming it and we're affirming all the connotations, all the connotation, what Imam Ghazali says, the spirit of the hand. We're affirming all the connotations all at once and we're not denying the hand of God. So the use of the term hand denotes agency and can refer to creativity in one context, generosity or favor in another, power or domination in another, support and allegiance in yet another. The hand also signifies affabil affability as a handshaking. So the, the exalted chose to use these exp expressions of hand, hands, two hands, and right hand, rather than resorting to that wheel or reinterpretation, we affirm the, the, the hands while denying any assimilations, resemblances, modalities, or conceptions of hands that are parts of, or appendages. In this way, the message can reach the audience with the full rhetorical strength and richness of the revelation and without obstruction. So will you translate it? Yes, I will. I will translate the hand, the Yadan, or, you know, Kharak to be a day. I will translate them into created with my two hands as 99% of the inter translators did. You know, most of the uh, translations of Quran will have, you know, what I created with my uh, own two hands. Uh, one used authority, and, and I'm not familiar with if, if anyone was faithful to delegation delegationism, because if you're faithful to delegationism, you cannot translate it. You cannot give it a primary meaning or a secondary meaning. You will have to leave the word in Arabic. Um, so how do you then guarantee that you will not you you won't add false meanings? We we will choose the most appropriate word in the in the language in the second language, because that's also true for the source language. Allah used the most appropriate words, but realizing that this is a language that we humans developed to denote things in our experience. And he used the same language to denote or to refer to things that are completely beyond our mortal comprehension, but they are most suitable. Uh, so, and we we refer back to the Arabic origin if there is, is uh, if there is conflict. Sometimes certain words that we will transfer to certain languages we may not find a good word. Explain it. Don't don't translate it. But. Uh, for, for instance, hand, yad, and hand in English. Can we translate this? Yes, we can. Because hand in English does not necessarily mean uh, the, the flesh and blood, the hand that is made of flesh and blood. It, it, it can have sort of what may be used, what may be called metaphorical use, usage by some, or, or not, but, but anyway, it, it, it means other things than uh, basically the fresh and blood. If there, if in a particular language, the counterpart of hand only means flesh and blood, we will not translate it. We will refrain from that translation. So how do you guarantee that the second audience will be like the first audience? A primer of Tenzi will be needed for the second audience, just like a primer of Tenzi, which is exoneration of God, acknowledging the incomparability of God and the transcendence of God will have to be uh, laid down first. And then you translate them without a problem. So, so the, the, the next issue, which is, a, which is a big issue also, which is the supervening of events in the divine absity, uh, is, is, is a big issue. Because keep in mind the Kalam cosmological argument. To prove the second premise of this Kalam cosmological argument, we needed to say that Accidents subsist in bodies. Accidents, uh, you know, alternate. So if they are described at one point of non-existence, they cannot be eternal. And since bodies cannot be separated from accidents, bodies are also um, uh, temporal and not eternal. 
So if you say that God, that new events subsist in God, you apply the same thing to God, and then we, we, are, we have a problem. So we have a problem with the concept that God would create at a certain time, that the action of creation at a certain time uh, indicates any uh, event subsisting in God, any new thing subsisting in God, or speaking at a certain time. So everything about God must then be eternal, nothing new whatsoever subsists in his absurdity. Certainly, we do not want to use this is not an expression. Uh, new events or temporal uh, originated events subsist in him. This is not an expression that the revelation used. But, but again, at the same time, we want to say that he does things one after another. Because that's what the Quran said over and over again. So to Aristotle, the final cause or unmoved mover must be changeless and undifferentiated, undifferentiated and undifferentiating. Thus, he does not instigate any new action or influence in the universe. The celestial spheres rotate in their place in wonderment of him without him exerting any force on them. The philosophers of this school deny God's knowledge of the changing particulars of the universe. Uh, because it's obvious that would indicate a relational change in God. Aristotle believed in an eternal universe without beginning, so he didn't have a problem with this. But Ibn Taymiyyah says they they cannot escape from the, the contradiction because that universe is full of new things happening. So this concept of a static God of completely actualized potential is metaphysically impossible for that God to be effectively related to the changing world and conflicts with the Quranic description of God. So, the notion that change cannot subsist in the pre-eternal is not a matter of agreement, we have to understand this, between the philosophers. Even Plato, you know, and certainly Plato is before Aristotle, but, but pre-Aristotelian, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah talks a lot about asatin al-falsafa qabla Aristotle. So, pre-Aristotelian, the greatest philosophers or the major philosopher prior to Aristotle. You can find in Plato's dialogues, for instance, uh, him saying this. Can we ever be made to believe that motion and life and soul are not present with perfect being, God? Can we imagine that being is devoid of life and mind and exists in awful unmeaningness or everlasting fixture? So recently, the concept has been further challenged by many, like the evolutionary idealists and their understanding of the creative spirit. And Harley, over, uh, Harley Overstreet is, is, is one of those, and we will come back and, and uh, mention a, a few uh, of his contentions that are very uh, valid. Uh, so, Here's the problem. New creations without new cause. Here is the dilemma. Uh, okay, so, so, so basically the, the rational theologians and Aristotle, they agree, Aristotelian philosophers, they agree that new things or new events cannot subsist in God. But there are new creations. What do we do about this? So the Maturidis, they basically came up with an eighth essential attribute of God. So in addition to the seven, you know, life and knowledge and power and hearing and seeing and uh, uh, kalam uh, and will, they, they added taqween, which is Genesis, a sort of eternal umbrella attribute for all actions that will come afterwards. The Ash'aris argued that those actions are not attributes and they do not subsist in, the, in God, but rather the attribute of Qudra, which is eternal, has actualization relationality. Ta'alluq tanjizi. That's my best translation for ta'alluq tanjizi. With its different actualizations in the particulars. To others, neither proposition solves the problem. 
So Aristotle, for instance, uh, I'm sorry, Ibn Rushd, for instance, says, the problem is not the lag between the, the, the pre-eternal will and the creation of the universe, but rather between the act of creating by God, by the creator, and the created coming into existence, particularly if the creator is omnipotent. So the omnipotent creator, his act of creation should result in the created thing coming into existence immediately. And here is the Quranic description of God. So the Quran describes a God who engages with his temporal creations time and time again, as he wills. Say Allah begins creation and then repeats it. Every day he's bringing about a new affair. Perhaps Allah will origi originate after that a different matter. It is he who created for you all that which is on the earth, then, and, and that is why I colored them differently, then. Every then in the Quran, when it comes to the actions of God, is talking about the before and after. One thing after another, one action after another. So describing Ibn Taymiyyah's point here, I, I, want, I wanted to basically quote um, a contemporary Maturidi uh, great scholar, Allama, Muhammad Anwar Shah al-Kashmiri, who was, you know, uh, actually very inspiring because that's the way you engage in discourse about matters of creed. Very respectful, but he's, he's not in agreement with Imam Taymiyyah, but he's saying regarding the position of Al-Hafiz Ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah be pleased with him, radiallahu anhu, which is something we use for the Sahaba, but he uses for major scholars. He uses it for major scholars. He says he believes that the temporal attributes subsist in the creator and are not created. He claims, clearly he is not saying that he basically will buy it. Uh, so he claims that this is uh, uh, the way of the predecessors. He denies the notion that the occurrence of these attributes in the eternal is impossible. He also distinguishes between the created and the temporal with the created being separate. And that's important. The, the, the attributes of God cannot be separate from God, which will come back when we discuss uh, Jesus, peace be upon him. So with the created being separate, so the entire world is temporal and created, unlike the attributes, they are temporal, but not created, the actions of God, for they subsist in the creator exalted as he. So al uh, alama uh, Muhammad Anwar Shah al-Kashmiri says the language supports him. And I love this because, you know, you do not have to basically uh, deny your opponent every argument. Conceding some points is not a problem. You could still come back and re re reject uh, his conclusion, but concede some points so that the discussion is objective and sensible. So he says the language supports him. For it is said that Zayd is described by standing up, but we cannot say that he created that. He created his standing. It's, a, it's an attribute. Zayd stands up. It's an attribute of Zayd. He doesn't make the standing. Similarly, we can say that Allah is characterized by descending, but uh, we cannot say that he created that. Imam al-Bukhari, and that is uh, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Anwar Shah uh, Kashmiri, also conceding one, one more point. Imam al-Bukhari held a similar view and stated that Allah is characterized by temporal attributes, but the commentators have reinterpreted his statement. Which statement is he referring to? This statement that Imam Taymiyyah at least repeated seven times in his books. Of Imam al Bukhari. He says, This is the action of the Lord, blessed and exalted be He, and His command, the Lord, 
with his attributes, actions, and commands is the creator and generator and is not created. So the attributes, actions of God are, his, uh, are not created, part of God, subsist in God. And the result of his action, command, creation, and composition is created and generated. So there is a separation here between the cause, the effect, and the act. Imam Taymiyyah is saying the only way we may not we may be able to not concede to the philosophers the proposition about a beginningless world is by rejecting their conception of a God who is fixed and undifferentiating and affirming his volition and attributes. There are cause, ca causes and effects, and between them the act. There should never be infinite regression of causes, because that is disbelief. Because if you, infinite regression of causes means non-existence of anything. But when you have a first cause already, there could be, which we will not call it infinite regression of, of effects, but if the effects are emanating from the first cause who's eternal, there is no problem in going back for eternity. New effects, new enacted things, new actions, going back for eternity with God. Uh, so time for, for in the Taimian uh, view, there was no timelessness ever. Time always existed because of the perpetual agency of God. Time derives itself from the perpetual agency of God. So God in a hadith reported from the Prophet وسلم, says, I am time. Anad-dahr. People curse time and they don't know that they are cursing me because I am time. Uh, so when we say that time derives from the, the rotation of the earth around the sun, that is in our sense. That is in our sense. Because God said that he created the heavens and the earth in six days. Well, that's before the sun and the rotation of the earth around the sun, there was time. God also says, you know, on the tongue of his uh, truthful messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that, uh, that he created, that, that he wrote the destinies of uh, the world before he created it by 50,000 years. So that is basically duration, period. Mm -hmm doesn't have to be our years, doesn't have to do anything with the sun, but that is duration uh, here that, that he's referring to. Uh, so I am time. So the perpetual agency of God uh, makes the concept of time uh, basically uh, it, it eternal. The initiation of a certain action does not necessarily indicate a change or an acquisition of a new attribute of the essence. His power is eternal, but its actualized deliverances happen in succession. So, so that's, that's the, the main concept here. The power is eternal. You cannot tell me that because I am saying God creates one thing after another, that this is a change in his essence. No, it's not a change in his essence. He is, it has been eternally most powerful. The, 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 the actualized deliverances of that power uh, are timed, and that is not a problem. They come in succession, but we still don't need to say because that is not, or emergent events subsist in him because that's not what the revelation used. So Imam Taymiyyah here, in one strike, you know, this slide and the next one, he would answer the uh, rational theologians and the philosophers. So they say, they both say that nothing new can subsist in God. The rational theologians, but, but everybody know, but, but the rational theologians are saying that the world existed at one time, was created at one time, and they are not providing an explanation for this because that must have been created by the action of God. And the, the philosophers are saying that the world is beginningless because since nothing can subsist, new, new can subsist in him, 
uh, the world must be beginningless. So he answers both. He says to the rational theologians, this is the view of most Mu'tazilites, Ash'arites, and others. They acknowledge that the maker who originates things without, an, without a renewed temporal co cause of the occurrence. This has led to many criticism against them on this matter. And people have said to them, this violates the fundamental principle that you have established for the maker, which is that the possible, mumkin, cannot be inclined to one side or the other without a cause that tips the scale, preponderator, preponderator. Therefore, if the times are identical and the agent remains in the same state without anything new subsisting in him from the past eternity to the future eternity, then one of these times is singled out as the time of occurrence. Then this would be preponderation, tarjih, without a preponderator. But then he turns to the philosophers, and this is the, the same uh, place. He turns to the philosophers and he says, as for the philosophers who espouse the eternity of the world, such as Aristotle, Ibn Sina, and others like them, they used this as an argument. They used this as an argument against the people who say the world has a beginning. The fact that new things do not, do not subsist in God. Against those who believe in the creation of the world. However, their assertion includes something even more absurd than that. They claimed that all events occur as a result of a past eternal uh, complete cause. Complete cause. Necessitating by its essence. So the world is flowing from God by its essence. It's necess necessitating the world by its essence. Its effect. And that nothing is delayed from its effect. Ibn Sina and his peers state that the first cause moves the moving things to imitate it and so on. And then, he is, so he says eventually, therefore, it follows that all events originated without an originator, which is a greater absurdity than believing that they occurred without a new cause. This has been explained in more detail in its proper place, where he says to the philosophers, you know, forget about the universe, the creation of the universe. The hudus, the origination of new things, new events happening is undeniable. It's, it's, it's our empirical experience of the universe every day that things ha are ha happening. Uh, and and you're, you're saying that their cause is, is complete and eternal. How could they happen after, you know, eternity? Uh, so, so then how is he answering that, that if, if we're saying that divine attributes subsist in God? So I've just got uh, this. This is my, my favorite edition of that. It's called A Letter About Jesus Christ, the Word of God by Ibn Taymiyyah. It's just a, there are lots of editions of this uh, text uh, we're referring to. It's just, um, it's a particularly colorful and easy to read edition. <laughs> so. So, so he, mm. the, the argument that would be leveled against them is that you're saying, for instance, that the word of God is part of God and God spoke at one particular point, uh, the Quran, uh, the, the speech of God is eternal, but God spoke the Quran at one particular point. So why are you not applying this to Jesus where the Quran says Jesus is the word of God and the Quran is the word of God. So why can't G Jesus be described as divine? uh in this case so uh, his argument he has you know you have the book but he has a, a couple of arguments here that are the main arguments that jesus was separate from god one willful agent another willful agent separate from god the quran is an attribute and it is not separate from god you cannot say you know the, you cannot say that that uh arad or accidents subsist in the quran uh, because it's a quality, and you cannot basically say that qualities subsist in the quality. Qualities subsist in Jauhar, another entity, a separate entity in which qualities will subsist. We can all realize that Jesus was a separate entity in which qualities subsisted, not the Quran, which is uh, the speech of God, 
Um, so uh, basically, that is that is his main argument. An attribute is a quality that does not exist independently. Jesus had a jawahar receptive of qualities. The Quran does not. Then the uh, then the idea of the perfect does not change. And I I, I quote uh, Harley over street here. Uh, I'm sorry, H Harry over street. Uh, because he he makes very astute observations, uh, very beautiful comments here. Um, he says, uh, you know, I, I'm going to come to a statement, but the difficulty we can't separate in our minds between the before and the past or the after and the future is that now is the present, the past, uh, present and future have different relations and values to us. So, uh, but let's suppose that the before and the after were all of equal clearness, intimacy, and value. Uh, Overstreet says, activity would necessarily mean change in the condition of the agent if he had to conform to the matter he is creating or reforming, or, or to exert effort to execute his volitions such that this uh, his acts are the expression of demands made upon him by conditions external to himself. Imagine a teller who must comply with the physical conditions of soil, nurture, uh, sunshine, and so on. If God, however, has infinite power, then his voluntary action is simply pure self-expression that is concerned with nothing foreign or external to the self. It neither adds something not of the self to the self, nor makes something of the self into that which is not of the self. So uh, two, two ideas here, the before, the, pre, the, the before and after to God are not different. They are different for us. There is before and after. He does think one, one after another, but they are the same in clearness, intimacy, and, and value, because his knowledge is uh, all-encompassing. In addition to this, when God does something, it does not exercise any effect on him, or it does not exercise any influence on him. He does not need to conform to the demands of uh, what he's creating or what he is doing. So pure self-expression, as Overstreet said. So change of the essence, then, and essential attributes would not be conceivable uh, of the eternal. Change of the essence and essential attributes is not conceivable of the eternal. But this does not preclude him from engaging his creation temporally and affecting his eternal qudra, power, and successive acts of creation, provision, giving life and death, istiwa, and nizud. Finally, eccentricities and accusations. Mm. Uh, that's the last segment. And I don't mean this to be pejorative, as I said before, uh, but Imam Taymiyyah has certain positions that are very minority position. And uh, two, uh, I think that valid criticism can be uh, directed to two uh, pos pos positions. Mm. Uh, one of them is the temporal events without beginning temporal events without beginning, which means creation after creation after creation. But I will explain what that means. It does not mean the eternity of the universe. It does not mean the eternity of the substance of the universe whatsoever. But we will explain this. The second is the annihilation of the hellfire. And the one that is completely unfounded and uh, sort of ironic and and just amazing is the is the uh, is takfir mm. um and hostility yeah okay so uh, okay so the, the the two that have that people have the right to basically uh, um criticize him for uh which does not mean that he was wrong necessarily, but I'm just saying that the people have the right to criticize. These are minority positions and people have the right to criticize them for. 
One is events without beginning. All other than God had a beginning for him. He explained this so many times. But, uh, okay, so the Aristotelian philosophers again and the universe and, and all of this discussion, we, we've, we've gone through this discussion, but for Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, for Ibn Taymiyyah, there's a, the concept of Dawam al perpetual agency. People would like to call it uh, events without beginning, hawadith or uh, new events or emergent events without beginning. That Ibn Taymiyyah said, hawadith la awala laha, or new events without beginning. But he would like to call it perpetual agency, dawam al God has been always a doer, speaker and a doer. And uh, this was his argument against uh, the philosophers when it comes to the beginning of you know uh, the world and the rational theologians that God has been always uh, active. But he says, uh, I'm sorry. So, so it is important for us to, to remember that for him there is no external reality for universals. There is no external reality for the genus of temporally originated things. Because that is something people, people who are a little bit more verifying, they say that Ibn Taymiyyah uh, says, uh, that Ibn Taymiyyah talks about the eternity, past eternity of the genus of the world. And certainly people who hear this don't understand what they mean. They just want to basically defame him in front of people, <laughs> or at least most of them, uh, in, in my own experience, uh, so that people will say that he is, he, has, he's, he thinks that the world is eternal like the philosophers, when it is completely false, completely false. Uh, but what they are referring to is that he's saying that there was creation after creation after creation. So alam to them, or the universe to them, is created things. That's their definition of alam. Anything other than God is alam, created things. So if Ibn Taymiyyah was saying creation after creation after creation, then he is saying that the genus of created things always existed with God from past eternity. And yes, he is saying that. But he does not, you know, in, in his own... Uh, Basically, ontology, there is nothing called genus in the external world. That's in our mind. That's a mental conception. But no, only particulars exist outside. Therefore, nothing other than God is past eternal. Not the world or the substance of the world. So God has been always active and creating things one after another for him from eternity, which is not, eternity for him is not timelessness, but time without beginning. So, but I, I, I basically made sure that I put this in red because this is, this is what he says, because everything other than Allah is originated and preceded by Adam, non-existence, preceded by Adam. So God does not need something to create another thing. According to the agreement of all people of heavenly religions, whether they are they affirm the perpetuity of his agency and that he continues to originate things after things, or did not affirm the perpetuity of his agency. He also says, all of what you, and that's talking to the philosophers, and those like you say proves only the perpetuity of action, not the perpetuity of an individual act or enacted thing. So on what basis do you claim the perpetuity of the celestial spheres or their substance or the intellects or souls or anything else? And I highlight substance because people think that he said that the substance of the world is eternal, but Allah is reforming it, reshaping it. Uh, but obviously he's not, he doesn't want to say that. So I, I am, you know, we're going to skip over this, but here he is trying to say to the philosophers, uh, 
that things are, or you know, uh, new things happen in the world. And if you deny, uh, if you deny that God uh, does things one after another, you will deny uh, new events in the world. And you can't deny this because you empirically can't deny them. Um, here he, uh, he makes uh, uh, some similar statements. Uh, th th this one, it, it, it's about the complete cause, you know, where, where he's saying, if you're, if you're saying that uh, God is a complete cause, the complete cause uh, basically is, results in the effect immediately. And if you're saying that God is complete ca cause, which means that the world flows from him, uh, in his essence necessitates the, the existence of the world, you will not be able to explain anything new in this world. And if you say that he is generous and the cause of his generosity is his essence and other such statements imply that the genus of action is necessary for him, but not specific, he, he's agreeing that, that this would imply that the genus of action is necessary for him but not a specific action or enacted thing. This does not indicate the eternity of the heavens or the substance or the matter of the heavens or other types of the world. Rather, this indicates that the particular action is not necessary. If it were necessary, then all of his actions would be eternal. And since the complete cause immediately results in its effect, all of his enacted things would also be eternal which contradicts our observation of the occurrence of new events in the world. So for him, he has been speaking from the beginning. And, you know, as an athlete, he needs to say, this is not all philosophy. He has to supplement, you know, or not sub substantiate his argument with Athar, reports from the predecessors. So he says, he reports from Ibn al-Mubarak and Ahmad ibn Hanbal, for instance, that they said that he has been speaking when he wills, what he wills, from eternity. Uh, so Professor Hoover says Ibn Taymiyyah ex ex expends much effort to show that the philosopher's attempt to arrive at temporal origination by way of intermediaries fails. And he does this in detail, but we will not uh, go there because it would uh, be long. Uh, now he would have to answer to certain reports that would indicate that there was a first creation. And one of these reports is the a Prophet's statement in Awal Al-Abad. Verily, the first of what Allah has created was the pen. He said to it, write. So it wrote what will be forever. Now that would have been a decisive argument or proof against this concept of perpetual agency or perpetual creativity. But in other reports that are authentic, reported by Muslim, even more authentic than this one, there is the, the, this uh, writing of the decrees happened in the existence of the throne and the throne was uh, over wa water, over water. So that is why many of Ahl al-Hadith and many of the scholars believe that water was the first thing to be created. So the pen, basically, based on this Hadith, is not the first thing to be created. And that's what Ibn Taymiyyah wants to prove. That's it. That this Hadith does not mean that the pen was the first thing to be, thing to be created because the throne was before it and the throne was over water. Uh, and then there is another hadith in which uh, the Prophet said, Can Allah uh, yakun shay'un qablahu? You know, so, so, so this hadith has two uh, wor wordings here. Can Allah wa yakun shay'un qablahu? There was Allah and nothing else was before him or with him. Two different reports before him or with him. But the end of the hadith said, and his throne was over the water. And he then created the heavens and the earth. 
So Ibn Taymiyyah is saying, well, the Arsh is not Allah. The Arsh is created. So this hadith is not decisive in the lack of creation uh, from eternity. Ibn Taymiyyah says the problem in saying that uh, the problem in saying that it is impossible uh, for new events to have been subsisting for eternity in God is that you're making it impossible for God to create before he created. If you're, if you're saying that it is impossible for the genus, for, for different worlds to have existed before this world, you're not only saying that God did not create, you're, you're saying it's impossible for events without beginning or creations without beginning. If you say it's impossible, then you are making it impossible for God to be omnipotent from eternity and created from eternity. Okay, now, Annihilation of the Hellfire mm. uh, is one of his uh, most controversial, if not the most controversial. Indeed. Uh, a part, it, is, it is part of his optimistic theodicy that mm. emphasized the encompassing mercy and ultimate benevolence of the divine plan. So he puts a lot of emphasis on the divine wisdom with the divine will. And uh, he, he would have any optimistic theodicy would, 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 would fall apart with the eternity of the hellfire. Because if most human beings, or at least a lot of human beings, will be destined to eternity, uh, to, to basically eternal torment, torture, then an optimistic theodicy is beyond reach. Uh, so I, I think that he was motivated by his optimistic theodicy, but as an athlete, he had to go and look for a way mm. I, you know, because as an athlete or a textualist or a scripturalist, and I'm not saying this uh, to say that he was insincere or anything about looking for proofs, but I, I would imagine that a textualist, why would this, you know, be a problem that a textualist would, would struggle with? Um, and, you know, why? Why would he be, you know, uh, so concerned about this concept of the eternity of the hellfire? Was this motivated by the text? Why is it not? Why did the same text not motivate many other textualists and scripturalists? Mm. I, I, I think the fact that he was basically immersed in both worlds, rational theology and scriptural theology, is, is behind this. Mm. Uh, so, so, but unlike others f f who have heterodox methodology, keep in mind, he's not the first person, he's not the first Muslim to say that. Uh, so the Mu'tazila, for instance, believe that that neither, uh, some of them, not, not, not all, but, but they believe that we will, everything will freeze, everybody will be motionless because perpetuity, perpetuity of uh, accidents or events cannot subsist or cannot exist in the future eternity just as much as it's impossible for them to exist in past eternity. So it's both ways for them. So not only people in hellfire, but also people in paradise, they will become motionless. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you know, some, some of them say that things will vanish uh, and some of them say that they will become motionless. And some major uh, Sufi uh, 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 figures have also spoken of uh, hellfire or the azab or the hellfire becoming the azuba or the, the pay, tor mm. torture of the hellfire becoming sweet. 
uh, because the, the the same word the adab and adub they come from so, and eventually they will basically be enjoying because they are fiery creatures they'll be enjoying the fire which will be a problematic uh, of course with the understanding of adab or to, you know the torment of the hellfire in the Quran and the Sunnah so. As a scripturalist, you do need to substantiate your position from the scriptures. So he had the scripture, uh, the scriptures speaking against the, the the vanishing of the hell fire because the scriptures used faridin, which means uh, to stay therein forever, and abada, which is another word to refer to abadiya or for future. Eternity. What is his argument here? Is that both words have not been used in the linguistic convention of the first audience to refer to future eternity. They have been used to refer to long durations, long periods. And the Quran itself says about the people in the hellfire, La Bisina Fiahkaba, that they would exist in there for long, for ages, for long periods. And that would be the concept. So why aren't you applying the same concept to Jannah, to paradise? Because Allah in, in several places made the distinction between Jannah and the hellfire. And Allah said, with regard to Jannah, uh, that it will be uh, basically provisions uninterrupted, whereas in the hellfire, in the same uh, location, he said about the hellfire, Inna rabbaka fa'anu lima yurid. Your Lord does whatever he pleases. But he did not say that it will be uninterrupted. So he would try to create, he, he tried to bring uh, some textual um, sort of substantiation for the argument of uh, the vanishing of the hellfire. So he tried to use orthodox methodology. That is why even if you consider this position to be shad or eccentric, anomalous or irregular, the methodology is not, which differentiates between, between the methodology of heretics and the methodology of Sunni traditional scholars. The methodology is not. He is using the same methodology. He's not telling you, you know, uh, reason supersedes here. Uh, he's not telling you uh, we will uh, have an esoteric interpretation of the Quran. He's trying to use the same textualist methodology, but trying to use it within the conventions, you know, the linguistic conventions. And then he will try to bring in reports from the predecessors to support his argument. And I do not want to go through them because mm -hmm. it's not like I want to defend that position. I will come to what I think about this position Shortly, I do not. It's not like I want to defend that position, but I want to tell you that uh, you know Imam Al Qayyim wrote thirty pages on this, and he filled them with what he considered to be good proofs in support of this position. And as scripturalist uh, theologians, they were not basically using a heretical methodology; they were using a traditional orthodox methodology. They try to explain the text. They try to bring in support from the Asar or reports from the predecessors, the companions, and uh, the followers of the companions. Uh, such as Omar saying, if the people of the fire were to stay in it for uh, the number, a number of grains of sand equal to the sand grains of the desert of Alij, they would eventually be brought out and other uh, reports. But anyway, I want to say, which is extremely important, that they did not only use orthodox methodology to arrive at this eccentric position, but also they did not adopt that position. <laughs> it's not like they just wanted to say it's conceivable. They wanted to say it's, it's a possible interpretation. And they refrained from upholding it or adopting it. That is both Imam ibn Taymiyyah and Imam ibn al-Qayyim, who wrote extensively on the issue. And I'm just going to read excerpts from what Imam ibn al-Qayyim said 
to show you that they had a non-committal suspension of judgment concerning this position. Mm. So after Imam al Qayyim defended this position by highlighting the perfect and majestic qualities of Allah, such as wisdom, mercy, graciousness, kindness, generosity, and affection towards his slaves. And then in two different books, this is how he ended the discussion in the two different books. You would say that it, it appears that he's inclined toward one way. Yes, he was inclined. Uh, Imam Taymiyyah may have been inclined toward the... Uh, finiteness or temporality of the hellfire, they may be inclined, but again, at the same time, they still had suspension of judgment to a great extent. So he says in Shifa al-Alil, I am, uh, that's Ibn al-Qayyim, I am with the opinion of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. He mentioned the entry of the people of paradise into paradise and the people of hell into hell. And he described that in the best way. Then he said, and Allah does with his creation, whatever he wills. And with Ibn Abbas, he says that no one should judge Allah in his creation, nor should he send them to paradise or hell. He mentioned this in the interpretation of the verse, the fire will be your dwelling place forever, unless Allah wills otherwise. And with Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, he says, and that the entire Quran concludes, he says, that the entire Quran concludes with this verse, verily, your Lord does what he wills. He said it in the context of the eternality of the hellfire. Verily, your Lord does what he wills. And with Ibn Zayd, he says that Allah has informed us of what he wills for the people of paradise by saying an unending provision, but he did not inform us of what he wills for the people of hell. At the, so at the end of his other book, which is Hadin uh, Arwah, he said, uh, if it is said, uh, so where have you arrived with your foot in this great and immense matter, which is greater than the world by multiple orders? It will be said in response to the statement of the most blessed and exalted, indeed, your Lord does whatever he wills. That is a non-committal suspension of judgment. Okay. So what do I say? What do I say about this? So the question Muslim apologists frequently encounter is why would the most merciful God create a creation knowing that he will send the most of them to eternal torment? And to be honest with you, uh i have a difficulty explaining this uh replying to this answering this so i believe that we should justify the mainstream position the question is not about justice because you can come up with answers to this but the question is uh, is about why the most merciful god would create a creation eventually to torment them forever uh so we should justify the mainstream position as much as we can. However, a fair mention of this position in any eschatological or theodical discussion, I believe is very important because many people would have intractable difficulty with the mainstream position. And if someone becomes a Muslim, accepts Islam, if you're a Da'i and someone has will not be able to wrap his head around the concept of the eternality of the hellfire, and you leave just a crack in the door open for them to come in, and they come in believing that hellfire is not eternal. I don't think that you, I don't think that this is a loss. I don't think that this is a loss for you as a dawi or a loss for them uh, as a recipient of of dawa. So uh, that's that's my position anyway. Now to fear and hostility. Um, and this is an accusation by all means, uh, because it's very, it's, it's, it's very disturbing to make that accusation. Uh, because if, if you look at, if you look, if you compare, uh, you know, uh, Taymiyyan, uh, sort of positions on the issue of takfir to our, to the tradition before him, uh, you will find him to be extremely understanding and lenient. Mm. Um, so, so Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, 
mentions this, he died in 505. Uh, he probably wrote this in 502 uh, or, or somewhere near near 502. You know, this is in Faisal, uh, Faisal at Tafrika. Um, uh, this is the, his, his book, The Criterion, um, on the boundary of uh, boundaries of faith. I think Sherman, the, Dr. Sherman Jackson translate have a, has a translation of the book, um, a good translation of the book. Anyway, so he says every group considers their opponents as disbelievers and att attributes their beliefs to the denial of the prophet. Peace be upon him. For example, that's Imam Azari speaking now, rahimahullah. Hanba the Hanbalis consider the Ash'aris as disbelievers, claiming that they denied the prophet's affirmation of the aboveness of Allah and his ascendancy above the throne. On the other hand, the Ash'aris consider the Hanbalis as disbelievers, accusing them of anthropomorphism and denying the prophet in that nothing resembles him. The Ash'aris also consider the Mu'tazilites disbelievers, accusing them of denying the possibility of seeing Allah and his attributes of knowledge, power, and the attributes uh, in general. The Mu'tazilites or Mu'tazila in turn consider the Ash'aris as disbelievers, claiming that the affirmation of attributes is, is, uh, is multiplication of the eternal beings and would uh, be basically, I, I'm not seeing the, the last uh, line here, but it, it, it would be amount to uh, composition, temporal origination, and, you know, God being uh, the denial of uh, the eternity of, of God. So everybody was making takfir of everybody, it seems. Mm -hmm. That's not true. That's not true. That is, that is many theologians doing this, but the public, uh, where, uh, alhamdulillah, praise be to God, immune to this. Mm. And I must, and I must regretfully, uh, to, to a great extent, immune to this to a great extent. In our history, we did not have as much sectarianism, like, you know, religious wars and, and things of that nature, like in Christendom, for instance. Uh, we had our own problems and, and our difficulties and, and, and so on, but, but, uh, we did not have, the Thirty Year War, for instance, uh, the, he, we had atrocities committed. We have to be uh, clear on this. In the name of religion, Ibn Tomar, for instance, who claimed to be Ashari and claimed to be the uh, the student of Imam Al Ghazali, uh, the direct student of Imam Al Ghazali, he killed hundred, you know, he killed tens of thousands of people because. To, to him, they were anthropomorphists uh, when he conquered, you know, uh, North Africa and he established his uh, Dawlat al muwahideen It is called Dawlat al muwahideen the state of al muwahideen people who believe in Tawheed. Anthropomorphists are people who are not Muwahid enough and they deserve to be killed. He killed al Qadi Ayat, one of the greatest scholars in our history. Uh, uh, he, he killed him because he was not munazzeh enough for him. Qadi Ayyad, you know, uh, is not necessarily straightforward athari, but, uh, or, you know, uh, of course not, but but he was not for him uh, um, munazzeh enough, did not basically exonerate God enough. So uh, he, 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 he killed him and he killed many others. So we we have a, we we had our share of uh, atrocities committed in the name of religion, but in general, maybe we fared a little bit better, at least in my assessment. Allah knows, but uh, judging even from uh, Western historians and and uh, others, we may have fared a little bit better in terms of tolerance because the public did not pay attention to this, and more importantly. And I should say this regrettably, uh, our politicians were a little bit wiser in this regard than many of our theologians. Mm. So our politicians would ignore this. Uh, they do not want unrest, they do not want trouble. Uh, so, but, but takfir and hostility was very common. You know, the, people make statements about takfir, very common about things that are very absurd to be uh, basically reasons for takfir. And Imam al-Razi, for instance, when he talks at the end of his book, Assess al uh he talks about the foundations of exoneration or something. He, he talks about the people who affirm 
Keep in mind, corporealists here would mean the people who believe in aboveness, the people who believe in spatial locatedness, and so on. So using the necessary concomitants, and he says that there are two opinions. One opinion says that they are kuffar, and that is the stronger position, he says. The first opinion, which is the most prominent one, states that these are kuffar. Okay. The second opinion, they are not kuffar because the Prophet ﷺ did not test people to make sure that they exonerate God above directionality and all of that stuff. Uh, but this is the, the position of uh, Imam Razi, rahmahullah. And uh, keep in mind, I, I, I ha we, we, we have no, I have no problem saying Imam Razi because uh, he basically he reached the ranking and status of uh, a great uh, leading uh, scholar. I don't uh, basically subscribe to his school of theology. That doesn't matter. You know, uh, I, I disagree with his uh, school of theology and I disagree with many of his conclusions. But we agree on the basic beliefs in God, and we agree that he was uh, a greater scholar uh, than, than uh, most of our contemporary scholars, at least. Hmm. Okay, so Imam Taymiyyah on takfir and innovators. Uh, Imam Taymiyyah has like startling statements about takfir that he would consider to be too lenient by, other, by, by many. So he says, for instance, everyone who professes Islam and is not a hypocrite is considered a believer, and their level of faith is proportional to what they have been granted of it. Even if they only have an iota of faith in their hearts, they will be saved from hellfire. Uh, this includes all individuals who dispute matters of sifat, divine attributes, and qadr, predestination, regardless of their beliefs. And he, he says about innovators, for instance, the next statement here, he makes the next statement about innovators. And he says that an innovator could be a wali. Uh, because, it, uh, you know, because he may be mistaken, forgiven. People who follow bid'ah innovations may possess both internal and external faith. But their ignorance and injustice can lead them to deviate from the sunnah. Such person is not a disbeliever or a hypocrite then he may be aggressive and commit oppression, which makes him a wicked person or a sinner. He may, however, be simply mistaken, sincerely following a flawed interpretation. Their mistake would thus be forgiven. In addition, he may have enough faith and piety to earn the walaya of Allah, to the level of wali, uh, translated sometimes as sainthood, although I don't usually do. Uh, in proportion to, to his faith and piety. So these are very lenient positions. And if you say that he's aggressive in his writings, you know, you, you have a book like Bayan Talbis al Jahmiya, why is he choosing this title? So we said Jahmiya, that is in reference to Jahm ibn Safwan, and his main interlocutors are not Jahmiya, they are Ash'aris. So why he's using this title? He's using the sort of the title in the expanded sense. Any negationist would be Jahmi. But keep in mind, he's coming at a time where he, his people were being called Mujassima, and that is almost like a death sentence. Uh, so this is a, a way of pushback. And, you know, they are being, the, uh, takfir is being made against them. So this is a pushback to say that what you are saying comes from a Jahm of one at the end. That's the end of the story. That is that is where it began from. Even though the you know you're not uh, mm -hmm. subscribing to Al Jam or Al Jam's positions. But wh where did he write that book? Uh, so so here, and, and I get this from Professor Hoover. Uh, he, uh, that Ibn Taymiyyah was moved from the tower of the Cairo citadel to the dungeon, the Jub, uh, in, in the citadel of Cairo. There was the tower and the dungeon. The dungeon was later demolished because it was unbelievably cruel. So he was removed from the tower to the dungeon uh, on the night of the Feast of uh, Breaking the Fast, five or six days after his initial incarceration on the 23rd of Ramadan in the year 705. This all happened in Cairo. Prisons in Cairo are still prison, are still terrible. Uh, but anyway, 
So he says al Qutbi said that he wrote in the dungeon of Cairo uh, in refutation of Ta'sis al Taqdis. His book, Bayan Tadbis al Jahmiyyah, was written in the dungeon, uh, in the citadel. And he finished it about six months before his release. So the entire book was written when he was in prison in the dungeon. Now, this is not a true picture of the Jub, because the Jub was demolished. Ibn Taymiyyah was not only a mujahid, but he was also an activist. And he was ex extremely active against uh, the bad conditions of uh, prisoners. And Nasser Muhammad ibn Qalawun was affected a great deal by Ibn Taymiyyah's activism against the, the, the conditions in the prisons. And in the same year Ibn Taymiyyah died, Nasser Muhammad ibn Qalawun uh, demolished uh, the jib uh, or the dungeon uh, in the citadel of uh, Cairo. But I got this picture, you know, it, I, it's not copyrighted, so I got this picture to, to show you possibly something close to it. But El Makrizi, who is one of our main historians, this is what he says in his book, Al Khutat, one of our main history books, about the, the dungeon, that very dungeon that Imam Taymiyyah was imprisoned in. He said, in the castle, there was a dungeon. Uh, the princess used as a prison. It was terrifying, dark, infested with bats, and had a foul smell. The prison, the prisoners suffered there what was more than death. So just to give you an idea of where he was when he wrote that book. Uh, so, but after leaving, so after leaving, keep in mind that still did not affect his intellect, did not affect his, you know, analysis or synthesis, as, we, as I will come back and say. But after leaving uh, th this prison, his brother, Sheikh Sharafuddin, as Ibn, uh, Ibn Rajab reports in Zayla Tabaqat al-Hanabila, his brother, Sheikh Sharafuddin, who was imprisoned with him, supplicated and prayed to Allah against those who uh, basically put them in prison. And Sheikh, the Sheikh said, that's Imam Taymiyyah said to him, rather say, he, he, he prevented him from supplicating against them. And he said, rather say, oh Allah, bestow upon them a light with which they can find the truth. And then when the Sheikh was brought back, as I mentioned earlier, and, and Nasr ibn Qadawun brought him back from uh, his exile in Alexandria or his house arrest in Alexandria, he told them, uh, that the judges who imprisoned Ibn Taymiyyah uh, and sided with his enemy are the best ju judges and he should not do anything to them because he will not be able to replace them. That is why the main judge who was an enemy of Ibn Taymiyyah said, we have never seen anyone more chivalrous than Ibn Taymiyyah. We tried our best to shed his blood, but when he gained power over us, he forgave us. Uh, so that is his treatment of his enemies. And, you know, one of his enemies, Al-Bakri, for instance, who uh, beat him in the street and brought the mobs to beat him in the street until he bled, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah uh, interceded for Al-Bakri with the Sultan to forgive him. And it, it you know, it, it, it shows his magnanimity and his graciousness, but when it comes to his respect of honorable, uh, non-hostile Ash'ari scholars, these are the hostile ones. When it comes to how he treated the non-hostile ones or hostile ones, um, there are many examples. The same things here, uh, like, you know, Ala al-Din al-Baji, for instance, one of the main Ash'ari scholars, uh, he would ask Ibn Taymiyyah to debate with him, and he would say, no, I wouldn't debate with someone like you. Someone like me uh, is, is not supposed to, to speak in the presence of someone like you. My function is to benefit from you. Uh, Sheikh Shams al-Din al-Asfahani visited Damascus, and Ibn Fadl al-Umari uh, says uh, that our Sheikh, Sheikh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, said to me, no one has ever come to our lands like Sheikh Shams al-Din al-Asfahani, 
who is a Shafi'i and Ash'ari, I saw our Sheikh Al Asfahani visit uh, him, Ibn Taymiyyah, once, and he stood up, Ibn Taymiyyah, to receive him and walked a few steps to greet him, offering him his seat. But Al Asfahani ref refused and said to Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, I'm sorry, this is not Ibn Taymiyyah. Oh, Ibn Taymiyyah said to Al Asfahani, We shall not speak when you are present. So Al Asfahani replied and said, Allah, Allah, our master the Sheikh of the Sunnah and the Imam of Scholars to Ibn Taymiyyah. But eventually Ibn Taymiyyah refused and made Al Asfahani give the lecture or the talk. So he says about his work for unity, people know that there used to be animosity and antipathy between the Hanbalis and Ash'aris and he was one of the keenest on uniting the hearts of Muslims and asking them to hold on to the rope of Allah. So still, was he temperamental? Well, perhaps you may say that, that he was somewhat mm -hmm. temperamental. Even uh, Imam Zahabi, his student, who said that I have never seen anyone like him, and by Allah, he has never seen anyone like himself. Uh, Imam Zahabi said that he was somewhat temperamental. Mm -hmm. uh, but but this is just, you know, two things that we have to say here. His personality was what we call Musawi Omari not Isawi Bakri. So Musawi Omari means Moses-like, Omar-like. Not Isawi Bakri, not Jesus-like, Abu Bakr-like. Anyone who reads, anyone who knows uh, prophets um, uh, Musa and Isa, uh, peace and blessings beyond them, sees some difference between their, their character. I mm. mean, prophet. So at the end of the day, he pulled Harun from his hair. He threw the, the, uh, the scrolls uh, and stuff. Um, and although, you know, Prophet Jesus also flipped the, the tables of the money changers, but, but generally speaking, if you look if, at the whole seerah of Prophet Musa and Prophet Isa, you will recognize the difference. If you look at the whole seerah of uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and Umar radiallahu anhu, you would recognize the difference between the two personalities. So Ibn Taymiyyah was of the Moses Omar like personality. Uh, and uh, the circumstances also, you know, that, that he went through uh, could make him more passionate about his beliefs, more passionate. You know, he's just. He is on a mission to basically save the Ummah from at least what he thought was destroying the Ummah. You know, the, the, the epistemological diaspora, uh, people that are rejecting reason, people that are exaggerating reason, and, and so on. And, and so on. He, he thought that he was, you know, on a campaign uh, to save the Ummah after the fall of Baghdad and after the Ummah has not only suffered many defeats against the Crusaders, but also many defeats against the Mongols who came from the East. So, but did his temperamental mood affect his analysis and synthesis? I would say no, rarely, if, you know, sometimes he would say, for, for instance, that the, these people are not being, uh, all, all, all what they are saying is, uh, is basically establishing Tawheed al-Rububiyya, the Tawheed of Lordship. Uh, but in all honesty, the rational theologians did have the classification that they blame on Ibn Taymiyyah, which separates between Tawheed al and al -Ruhiyya. They did speak of this and they did uh, basically point out the importance of Tawheed al uh, as well, or singing Allah as the only deity ver uh, deserving of uh, worship. Uh, but at any rate, uh, it rarely affected his analysis and synthesis and it did not cloud his intellect uh, ever. Mm. Uh, and also, from what we have seen, it did not overwhelm his forgiveness and graciousness. So uh, the summary for Imam Taymiyyah, uh, he, Imam Taymiyyah rahimahullah, rejected the conception of God as an abstract static deity and defended the Quranic depiction of God as an eternally active, wise and benevolent deity continuously involved with his creation. He emphasized the importance that the concepts of uh, affirmation and exoneration simultaneously to establish a balanced understanding of the divine attributes that was both faithful to the Quran and the Sunnah and conducive to a connection with God that was both 
reverent and intimate. So where do we go from here? And this will be our last slide. Uh, two principles, I guess, for discussions of Islamic creed, uh, measured exposure and disagree on love. As for measured exposure, I mean by this, that the basic explanation of, of Aqidah is what the uh, public needs. Um, going into these details, and, uh, and it may sound ironic because I went through details that the public uh, would not need, but I don't consider the viewers of this program to be necessarily of the uh, average. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so that's that's the, my reason here. So, emphasis on generation strengthening and refinement of faith is is extremely important because. The, the discourse, the, this the theological discourse, is basically to establish guardrails to protect us from deviation. It does not generate uh, faithfulness. It does not give you the sweetness of faithfulness that belongs to the to a different discourse, which is the purification of soul, tzedakah, uh, also called tasawwuf. That is the discourse that would generate, strengthen, and refine uh, faith and morality, both spirituality and morality. Um, and then finally, advanced students need more than the basic knowledge, and we need to be able to, uh, ha to, to have a free discourse uh, that is respectful and, uh, and basically uh, detailed. So that's why I disagree and love. Uh, focus on the issues while safeguarding our, our respect and love for all the pairs of uh, the tradition, avoid demonizing the opponents and exaggerating their errors, because sometimes we we don't demonize the opponents, but we exaggerate their errors, which eventually leads into demonization of the opponents. Acknowledge mm. that we should acknowledge that the opposition may have more knowledge and or intelligence than us. Uh, so we, we hold on to our beliefs because this is what we have come to be convinced of while acknowledging that the opposition may have more knowledge and intelligence than us. And finally, uh, I conclude by this beautiful statement from the Prophet ﷺ that we all need, say, I believe in Allah, then be upright. Thank you very much indeed. And before I conclude, I just want to say I do recommend uh, this book, uh, which has been referenced several times, Ibn Timir on Reason and Revelation, by C Professor Karl Scherf El Tubki, superb work, fantastic reading, and um, an introductory work, a critical introduction, by which I mean an academic introduction by an English academic, John Hoover, um, not without um, disagreements, perhaps, but with his interpretation of Ibn Taymiyyah, but I think overall it's, uh, uh, it's got a very, very good introduction to his life uh, and thought. So um, uh, for anyone who has persevered this, lo this long into the video, thank you very much for joining us. And thank you, of course, very much. Oh, yes, that as well. Over here, uh, Andrew. Dr. Andrew has been also on your program before. Yes. I think he's one of the people who are also familiar with Ibn Taymiyyah. And, uh, yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so I was looking for my copy as well. Yeah, that, that is highly recommended. <laughs> um, uh, as you say, on the Taymiyyah moment. Um, and uh, I'm actually having coffee, inshallah, with... Uh, over me, Andrew, I'm on Monday morning in London. He's coming to London and he's going off to Oxford and Cambridge to give lectures and things. Um, so um, thank you very much, Dr. Hatam al Hajj, for a, a, an extremely exhaustive and thorough and erudite and clear uh, and, and very balanced survey, uh, I, I think. Uh, clearly, you, you, you agree with much of what he says, but um, you're, you're very generous uh, in, and ironic in your attitude towards those who don't agree with uh, the Tamian theology. If you want to put it better, better way than that. So um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hatem El Hajj. Brilliant. Thank you, Brother Paul. Thank you very Thanks much for inviting me. Salam alaikum.